This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 253, recorded on October 3rd, 2013. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today, right here in the TWIV studio, Alan Dove. Good to be here. <laughs> I bet you thought I was going to say Dixon de Pommier, right? How you doing, Alan? I'm doing okay. Nice to have you visiting. It's been many years since you've been I The in last this time I was in this office, it looked pretty much like this, but without the, um, without the soundboard, uh, the computer screens were smaller. Um, <laughs> but other than that, it's pretty much, uh, and they've rebuilt the whole floor, but not the elevator or the bathroom. So, you know, some things look familiar, some things look... <laughs> Look new. You're here for some sort of meeting, right? Yeah, I'm covering a meeting tomorrow at uh, the New York Academy of Sciences. Um, Way at the other end of town. Yes, so at the other end of town. So I ditched my car at this end of town because I certainly don't want to drive to that end of town. Nope. And I but, now realize I probably shouldn't have driven to this end of town either. I, I think the best place to park when you're in New York is New Haven. <laughs> <laughs> how do you? How would you get here from Western Massachusetts? If that's you the pro, that's why I drove. It, you know, when I was living in New Haven, it was no problem. I just hop on Metro North or Amtrak. Um, so from where I am, yeah, you can drive to New Haven and take the train, or you, it's just uh, it's a mess. It's a pain. Yeah, can't get there from here. Yeah. Also joining us today, right here in the Twiv Studio, the offended Dixon. <laughs> I'm not offended. Well, you got to speak louder than I'm, that. I'm pleased, pleased and, and uh, filled with pleasure to be, again, part of the TWIV team. And if you've offended Dixon, you've really had an accomplishment. I, I would say that that takes a lot. Right? I work right. hard at it. It takes yeah. a lot. It takes a lot. Uh, I just introduced Alan first because he's a special guest, right? It's okay. No, well, it's fine. In the studio. No well, he's not a guest at all. He's, There's no offense. No, he's a regular member. He's but just... He's not here much. <clears throat> he's no. out of place. Yes. <laughs> Alan hasn't been here since he defended his thesis a long time ago. What year was that? Uh, that was 97. I popped back in. I was living in New York for a while, uh -huh. and I popped back mm. in a couple of times. But, uh, but yeah, I haven't been here... Um, I haven't been in, in this building since the since 2000, certainly. After we're done, we'll take you to the wall of polio. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I'll show you how, what's going on. Also joining us today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Hey, Kathy. Hi, Kathy. How's it going out there in Ann Arbor? Fine. We have lovely weather. It was supposed to rain, but we have white puffy clouds, blue sky, 74 degrees, 74% humidity. Very nice. Here it's uh, 26 bit warm, Dixon, for this time of year, isn't it? It's un unseasonably warm for October. That's but it true. is it is really cloudy. Look, look, Alan, you can yeah. see out the window. Yeah, I can see out the window. <laughs> it's, yeah. And also joining us today from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. Hey, Rich. Hey, Rich. How's Florida? Uh, well. <clears throat> <laughs> Do you have the official government reading? <laughs> it is. Oh. I'm trying to refrain from totally facetious comments here. <laughs> Uh, we are open for business, as far as I can tell. Yes. It is uh, 85 degrees. They haven't shut down the weather. It is 85 <laughs> degrees, 56 percent humidity, mm. dew point of 68 degrees, partly cloudy. It's a beautiful day. Nice. Now you were originally going to miss this twiv. That's correct. And now I you're here with us. That's correct. I am. Uh, let me see. It's Thursday at 2:25 in the afternoon. Uh, I was scheduled to be probably right now close to meltdown three quarters of the way through the first day of a <laughs> panel when, you know, you're just, your brain is fried. Right. But you're chugging along anyway, that's doing right. the best you can. There you go. And um, that's not happening. No. Gee, did, did the weather interfere? No, because... <laughs> yeah, what's the problem, uh, Rich? Why aren't the, you doing for that? For the uh, <laughs> listeners out, out there who may not be clued into this, this was a, uh, a peer review uh, grant review panel for the National Institutes of Health. 
right. where on the order of 20 some odd scientists get together with a clutch of administrators in a hotel in somewhere in this particular case it would have been Baltimore right. to conduct peer review on this would have been about 75 applications and establish the um, scientific merit of each of those applications. But However, somebody, somebody kicked the plug out of the wall, didn't they? That's the uh, <laughs> National Institutes of Health, yeah. and that is a government organization. So, since the government is shut down, right. uh, not only can that panel not meet, but I got a single email telling me that that activity was not going to happen, and that my airline reservations and hotel mm. reservations would be canceled automatically, which is fine, um, and that I could not communicate any further with anybody at NIH until the the shutdown. They can't even answer the email (laughs) until this uh, thing is over, at which time uh, they will try and uh, make some sort of plan for making this up, I guess. Yeah, it's like federal Shabbat. They they can't answer emails. They can't right. be, communicate <laughs> with good. anybody. They can't. Very uh, good. If the lights were on, they can't turn them off. If they were off, they can't turn them on. I think. <laughs> so you have no idea when you would meet again, right? No. And so uh, this or, is or how this is not trivial because people's laboratories are depending on this peer review, right? That's correct. As well, that's so fact, you know the people who had grants coming who were expecting grant checks; those right. may not be arriving either. That's correct. Yeah, so we have a colleague on this floor who just got a, his first R O one, his first grant, and it would have been awarded any day now, and he's not getting his money. Nope. And he doesn't, you know, know what he's going to do because he's got people in his lab who need to be paid. Right. There are. I forget. I've got the information here somewhere because I went to chair school last week. <laughs> Um, (laughs) There are uh, something, I will look it up, there are something on the order of 500 grant review panels, study Mm -hmm. sections for the NIH. So they're all shut down. And and October is the uh, prime time, one of of three times in the year where these reviews take place uh, in in the cycle. So this is a very, very busy time of year. And in general, uh, the uh, drill is that um, there's... Essential people can still do some minimal function at NIH, and with respect to grant review, what this consists of is that 48 hours out from when your panel is supposed to meet, if the um, shutdown is still in effect, you receive an email saying your panel won't meet. Hmm. Is that what you've been communicating, Kathy? We haven't heard anything yet. You've heard nothing? Well, no, because our panel isn't scheduled to meet until the 17th. Uh Okay. So, well, my I was told before this happened that uh, we would hear forty eight hours in advance of when the panel was supposed to meet. So for us, that was Tuesday morning, right? And we got a single email says game over. And just to make everybody feel nice and safe, the CDC has also sent uh, pretty much everybody home. They claim that they'll be able to respond to emergencies, but I'm not entirely sure how they'll know if there is an emergency. Dear, dear. We talked to Mark Palanch, uh, who is the CDC employee, while we were at the uh, ASV council meeting, what was that, two weeks, almost mm-hmm. a week and a half ago. Right. And he was, uh, he's scheduled to take a trip to Ethiopia for a conference having to do with uh, polio epidemiology, no doubt. Right. Uh, and he would leave for that meeting before the shutdown started, but the meeting would go through the deadline for the shutdown. So he, he may be stranded. Home. No, what he told us was <laughs> that when the shutdown happened, he would be uh, his obligation would be to leave the conference and rebook a flight and come home immediately on the first available flight. Good heavens! <laughs> or stay there on vacation. No, no, they can't. No. Federal workers can That's never the extend their trips with vacations. They said on NPR this morning that um, uh, geologists also have a skeleton crew, but if there were some kind of emergency, earthquake, landslide, or something like that, that some of them could get called back Physical in. Physical anthropologists have a skeleton crew, too. <clears throat> oh, I, mean, uh, I, was, I was waiting for something like that. So this is our science of impact, but of course it's much greater. Yeah. In many, oh, yeah. many people's lives. And and so. It's interesting the number of different ways that I see this showing up in what I try and do on a day-to-day basis. We try and uh, uh, access PubMed. Now, yep. it's still there, but it's not being maintained. If you try and access the uh, NIH website to do any of the normal business you do there, it's down. 
There's a number of other uh, functions. Uh, yeah, that regretfully, just... for those people that I picked last week, an uh, astronomy picture of the day, if you didn't see it before the shutdown on Tuesday, you're going to have to wait mm, yeah. because that <clears throat> site is down. Well, I had uh, not filed my income taxes yet because I got an extension, and it was due October 1, so I filed it on the 30th, and of course I haven't received an acknowledgement <laughs> that it's been received, and I won't until they get the government back up again. So here's the uh, here are the data that I had from the from uh, Chair School on uh, peer review. Uh, every year, now this is on a uh, three times a year cycle. So some of these things you have to divide by three. Uh, on a yearly basis, there are eighty six thousand applications received. There are sixteen thousand reviewers, two hundred and forty scientific review officers, wow. and fifteen hundred review meetings. That last is probably the most important, and that's where I get the five hundred. If there are fifteen hundred review meetings, then there's about right. five hundred a cycle. Wow. And like I said, a, 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 a big slug of those happen in October, another slug in February, and another slug in June. So this has uh, just a huge impact on peer review. Rich, what's Which, the stats on the 86,000 percentage that gets funded? Uh, that's on a different slide. I will have to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, you can't, accept, you can't access that right now. His, because his projector is jammed. I, 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 will, no, I will get that for you. Yeah, it would be interesting to know. Uh, gra grant success rates. Yeah. Now, um, I, uh, I, I presume I don't know what the units are of success rates. I presume this is a uh, number of grant percentage of grants funded uh, per uh, and denominator would be applications. Right. But I'm not sure of that. Uh -huh. uh, currently that is a little, it's about 16%. 16. In 1978 it was 35%. Oh, that's true. In okay. in two thousand six, well, right after the NIH doubling, yeah, in two thousand, it was thirty two percent. Oh, I'm sorry, in seventy eight, yeah, seventy eight, it was thirty five percent. In seventy nine, it was forty percent. Where are you getting these slides from? Uh, this is a from Chair School. Uh, uh, yes, from Chair School. Cool. Uh, uh, yeah. And uh, actually, oh, I should have pointed this out, and I will dig up this link. There was. Um, uh, this almost ought to be a, uh, uh, a, th a lot of these slides come from the office of the director of the NIH, hmm. who, uh, one of the things we learned at chair school is that N NIH has typically taken a pretty conservative attitude about, uh, you know, publicizing or making a big deal about funding rates and that kind of stuff. They try and put as happy a face as they can on mm. it, but they realize that it's getting so critical <clears throat> sure. that they actually have to make some noise. And I believe that some of these slides uh, are on the director's side. I'll look it up while we're talking. But importantly, this success rate thing, Yeah. Uh, let's look at, right, the NIH doubling happened in the 90s, right? Mm -hmm. And that basically ended about 2002. At the end of that, the success rate was 30%. And that has now fallen uh, to uh, about half that, 15%. Amazing. Did you give it a try, Dixon? Well, when I, <laughs> I did for six times and I was okay, <laughs> it was that seventh time that kills me every time. <laughs> and By the way, the, the, the late... percentage of PhD graduates who end up in a um, tenure-track faculty position five years after finishing has followed almost that same percentage. Mm. Sure. Yeah. Gee, surprise. Well, the, uh, ac the, the universities and colleges of this country that do research depend highly on yep. NIH to, to at least oh, life, you know si life sciences, yeah. I'm not going to be able to look up the NIH director. No, of no, you not. can't. No, you can't. No, you can't. So, Rich, I presume that all the entertainment at night after the chair's meeting finished, they went to Chippendales. Is that correct? Uh, <laughs> not quite. So I just looked on the Amtrak site because it's, it's still running. Oh, Am Amtrak is a, is a private. sort of private corporation with right. a government blessing kind of arrangement. And so. they have a... Big ad in the upper right. Low fares from D.C. <laughs> you want to leave? Not to. <laughs> yeah, from. Nobody wants to go there. That's right. All right. I thought we would do all email again today. Sounds yeah. good. We have a lot. And I'm, we're going to get through all of these, right? 
I think so. Yeah. Try. We have a couple of follow ups. First one is from Patrick, dear Twiv team. Make a call to the Twiv universe, and the Twiv universe responds with regards to Kevin email and also Vincent's Barb suggesting that we're not listening. <laughs> Here are our thoughts about why there's no systemic antiviral response as has been described by Carolyn Coins Lab at their at the maternal fetal interface. One possibility is the one that Alan suggested that a lineage with the placental antiviral response gone systemic went extinct. There's no need to invoke forward thinking by evolution. And Carolyn Coyne's work has already actually shown that certain viruses, most prominently CMV, cytomegalovirus, have in fact already figured out a way to both evade and exploit the placental antiviral response, so such a systemic response could be rapidly selected against. Another possibility is that there's some unique placental biology at the maternal-fetal interface such that the antiviral mechanism may not be beneficial in other contexts. We think that is unlikely because the COIN lab showed U2OS cells engineered to express the placental microRNA cluster confer antiviral properties to the supernatant. We think the most likely scenario is one in which a systemic utilization of this type of autophagic response would be detrimental, even in the absence of an evolved supervirus able to overcome it. This would be consistent with the control of interferon and other antiviral responses. These systems are highly regulated because inappropriate activation is harmful, inflammation, cytokine storm, autoimmunity, etc. Since there does not seem to be a sensor that turns on the deep breath, <laughs> microRNA-mediated exosome-delivered antiviral <laughs> autophagic response... <laughs> There's got to be an acronym for that. Yeah. The placental tissue must have co-evolved to be able to handle a hyperautophagic state, but in other tissues, such constitutive activity could very likely be damaging. We like this line of thinking because it's consistent with tight regulation of other antiviral genes and offers an explanation to the frequent occurrence of pseudo pseudogenization or gene loss events in antiviral gene families like TRIMS, IFITS, and APOBECTS. The idea is, if you need it, you keep it, but that otherwise it might be too detrimental to keep on constantly or even keep in the genome at all. Although we don't know that the rampant autophagy going on in the placenta would be damaging to other tissues, there are certainly plenty of examples of overuse of antipathogen responses being extremely bad for the host. See the work from Russell Vance's lab showing that constitutive activation of the inflammasome can kill a mouse in 30 minutes. And also, we talked last time, we had a, a letter from an email showing, uh, discussing a paper in, which showed that Apobex uh, can be tumorigenic, in fact, or I should say mutations in tumors, human tumors, are found in the Apobex genes. So that's the price you pay. Rainy and 13 in Seattle. This is Patrick and Matt, who are postdocs in the Malik lab, who we saw, Rich and I, when we visited last time. And Matt has a little... P.S. here. Thanks for giving our recent paper in overprinting in Mer on overprinting in Merkel cell polyomavirus some airtime on TWIV 250. Hopefully it'll get the TWIV bump. Your episode number 214 on the raccoon polyomavirus that is associated with brain tumors came out right as we were writing this up. And since raccoon polyomavirus is one of the viruses where I found this new overprinting gene, I wanted nothing more than to email you and suggest that the people studying this virus should look for a role of the gene in their virus and the associated cancers. That didn't seem like a good idea, given the fact that the paper wasn't even submitted yet, but hopefully they've heard about it by now and are looking into it. Cool. All right, so you guys are listening. I'm grateful. Yeah. Well, so I thought that your comment was that the that bosses. Harmeet and Sarah don't listen, but the people in the lab do, yeah. and that they would be the ones... Yeah, to clue in, absolutely. So, in which, which is what happened. Right. <laughs> uh, the next follow-up is from Richard. Hi, Vincent and fellow hosts. Still loving the podcast, et cetera, et cetera. Insert listener from first episode, blah, blah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Weather for today, 14C cloudy, wind 6 miles per hour from the southwest, 86% humidity. Random non-virus-related email. You don't have to have a V8 to go fast. <laughs> Here's a kit car. I'm sure you've had such things. It's a 2.1-liter engine with race cam and some adapted motorcycle cards, homemade exhaust manifold, and exhaust roughly 160 brake horsepower at 7,500 RPM. 
I know what BHP stands for. Wow. Yeah, the, the it's very key, impressive. It's my son. The key <laughs> is weight. It's less than 400 kilograms and therefore goes quite well. It also spits flame from the exhaust <laughs> <laughs> and makes people wander up and say, what's that? It sounds awesome. Sort of noises. I know this is a bit random, but you mentioned you like driving. I'm the same and made myself a car for that purpose. Well, anyway, right. keep up the great podcast. Well. I, I sort of heard about kick cars, but I don't think I would have the time to make one. So my colleague here, Saul, <clears throat> who Alan knows, mm-hmm. has a Bentley. Yep. Wow. Which has 12 cylinders. Correct. And when he starts it up, you, the sound to me is unbelievable. <laughs> it is so beautiful. <laughs> he's, he's said to me on more than one occasion, you can't have too many cylinders. <laughs> <laughs> or too many Bentleys. <laughs> Sadly, he has to sell it because he can't get into it anymore. He has a bad hip. Oh. Isn't that sad to have to sell it? It is. It is. It is. It is. Uh, All right. By the way, I found... Uh, the uh, link I was looking for. Mm-hmm. It's actually uh, Francis Collins, director of the NIH, <clears throat> has a director's blog. And uh, one of his recent blogs uh, is entitled One Nation in Support of Biomedical Research? Question uh, mark. And I put that link right up of the follow up there. That has the graph in it that I was referring oh, to cool. and another and a summary of it. Oh, that's great. Nice. Put those in the show notes. That's nice. good info. All right, our last follow-up is from our friend Robin, uh, low-dose viruses. Emergency department personnel recognize that newcomers tend to have a lot of coughs and colds during their first year or so. Thereafter, they tend to be free of such maladies with only occasional sniffles, but on the rare occasion when they do get one, it's a whopper, laying them low for several days. Once upon a time, little children seen in the emergency departments had winter vomiting disease before it was associated with the Norwalk agent. The diagnosis was made by filling up their tank, hydrating them. This was judged by the color of their urine. If light-colored, dilute, their tank was full. If they would smile after that, they could go home. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Nice. My father religiously vaccinated everyone in the family once a year for smallpox when I was growing up. (laughs) Good Lord. (laughs) He related the time when he worked at a smallpox ward in a hospital during his medical school days. Prior to that, his vaccinations would always take, but after that, they never did, although he continued his own yearly (laughs) vaccinations. That seems a bit over the top, doesn't it? totally over the top. Yeah. Every year. Could be Every year. Remake after that, yeah. However, yeah, yeah, if, yeah. You have wor- if you have worked in a smallpox ward in a hospital, yeah. that's going you might some. be so incredibly traumatized yeah, and scared right. to death that yeah, you right. would do yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, wow. Yeah. Hummingbirds versus pigeons when driving around town. That's the difference between performance cars and the rest. <laughs> It's not so much what they do on the freeway. The size of the engine is not by itself a determinant of a car's performance. One has to consider both the horsepower and the tear weight. Yes. <laughs> the current car, a 2007 Corvette oh, Z06, right. has seven pounds per horsepower. My previous one, a 1993 Supra Twin Turbo, had 11 pounds per horsepower. This is becoming, um, what's that TV show about cars? Velocity? Um, High velocity? No, no, it's the BBC um, program. What top, is gear? Top, top Gear. Top Gear. <laughs> This week in Top Gear. <laughs> Types of diabetes. They are entirely different beasts. Uh, diabetes mellitus type 1 has a lack of insulin, while type 2 has a lack of receptor function. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Risky behaviors. Jumping out of helicopters was mentioned. <laughs> from a different perspective, that might be a prudent thing to do, especially from government helicopters. <laughs> yeah, because they're all on the ground. <laughs> That's true. <clears throat> Viruses versus seeds. Seeds are metabolically active, although at a low rate, as is the case with cysts and spores. Extremely low metabolic rates are found in long-surviving seeds, as is the case of plants from hot, arid regions. Right. Higher metabolic rates occur in the case of seeds from tropical wet regions. Many of the latter cannot tolerate even moderate desiccation, including mango seeds. Seeds require attention to proper storage conditions, which can vary widely. All of them have shelf lives. They are not equivalent to pebbles or rocks. <laughs> seeds are not an analogy for viruses. The vertical farm guru can tell you that. <laughs> is that right, Dixon? It is true. Okay. I, I had the privilege of visiting the seed bank in Korea, uh, in Suwon, and it was a huge building, almost as half the big, half as large as the building we're now in. And they showed me the storage units for the seeds, and they were all different. 
Some were humidified, some were cold, some were frozen, some were at room temperature, some were hotter than room temperature, some were with humidity, some were without. It was quite amazing to see all the varieties of Korean seeds that had been collected and, and the need for individualizing their storage capacities. Well, viruses differ in their ability to tolerate <laughs> to tolerate drying out, yeah, right? Well, you know, okay, some you can okay. uh, are transmitted by fomites, some are not. Yeah, 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 no, no, no. It's, uh, it's very I understand I it's it. not the right analogy. It's a, it's a, but, yeah. But I think yeah, I mean, what else would be a rock? No, a rock doesn't infect the cell and come no, to life, no, so. No. I guess they're unique. I guess. Camelids. <laughs> Arabian dromedary, one hump, right. Bactrian, two humps, llama, right. guanaco, alpaca, and vicuña. No humps. <laughs> Mers, if 50 out of 50 Omani camels have it, it has been around the block for quite a while. And if it is the same virus in humans, then they have had it for about as long. <laughs> well, we don't know because they didn't get any virus from camels. So. Right. right, that's the big question. VZV is forever. Varicella zostivar. The original chickenpox may be so mild as to pass unnoticed. It lives in the dorsal root ganglion neurons. Reactivation gives an anatomically accurate depiction of dermatomes. Polydermatomal herpes zoster, more than one non-adjacent dermatomes, suggests immune compromise. Without any other predisposing history, malignancy, chemotherapy, etc., it is a good reason to check for HIV, even with them, for that matter. That's a good point. All right. Well, that's the end of this episode, isn't it? <laughs> it's about <laughs> well, all the thank information. Thank you for listening to Twiz. That's right. After <laughs> venting and reading. <laughs> all right. Uh, Alan, why don't you start with the sure. first Sure. Uh, Asaf writes, hello, Twiv team. I just submitted my PhD thesis in microbiology at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, Israel. I found out about your podcasts almost uh, a couple of years ago, starting with Twim. And as I was out of new episodes to listen to, I moved to Twiv. I still have about 100 episodes to go before I catch up. Uh, well, so probably re we're reading this email right about in sync with their listening. <laughs> uh, I've been waiting for a good reason to write and express my appreciation and gratitude for the wonderful job you all do for so many years now. As I'm no longer in the university listening to seminars and journal clubs, I'm currently running the laboratory of the biggest winery in Israel. Wow. Mm -hmm. Your podcasts help me feel that I will always stay a scientist. The misfortunate reason for this letter is the recent detection of wild polio in Israel. Yeah. As you wrote in your blog, wild polio was detected in the sewage in southern Israel around February 2013. I should mention that the oral vaccine was given since the 80s, but a few years ago, maybe eight years ago, our Ministry of Health shifted to the attenuated vaccine. Um... I think you mean the inactivated vaccine. Yes. Yes, um, it does. Now that wild polio was detected, Ministry of Health wants kids under eight to get the oral vaccine, despite having been va vaccinated by the, um, the inactivated one. Another point worth mentioning is that several communities in Israel are known to have low vaccination coverage, some of the extreme Orthodox, some of the Bedouins, and some, quote, new age communities. My questions to you are, one, the attenuated vaccine is given as a few distinct shots, an inactivated vaccine again, uh, three of them before the baby is one year old. Why is it given this way? I probably ought to do these one at a time. Well, I believe it's to get a booster effect because it's yes. an inactivated vaccine, doesn't replicate, so the first yeah. immunization, the, the uh, antibody levels are low. That's a fairly common yeah. schedule for, for injected vaccines, actually, is right. you, you give multiple. In fact, uh, the oral polio vaccine is usually given in multiple doses, too. Mm-hmm. Um, and, actually, and three, actually oh. interesting, there's a couple of motivations for doing this. One is a booster, and the other is that if you sort of sociologically uh, introduce that protocol, then you get uh, overall better coverage. Yes. Because you, you may get people who didn't get the first one. Sorry, Kathy, what were you going to say? No, I was just going to point out that all three polio types are in each shot. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, the attenuated vaccine is also given, as you said, Alan, in multiple doses. And that's because each time there's interference of two serotypes with the third. Right. So each time you get one of the three serotypes giving you good immunity. So that's why you do three. Right. I think with the injected, you just get a population effect where a certain percentage yeah. is immune after the first one, a certain more percentage additional after the second. And it's been found that after three doses, you get um, very close to 100%. Exactly. And, and that's true of uh, Hep B. That's true of, uh, uh, I think, most of the other protective vaccines. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and, and they're tetanus. So they're set up that way. Well, some of them also, right? Pertussis and tetanus also expire 
the immunity goes away. Yep. Um, yep. All right. Second, my <coughs> own baby is 11 months old and starts kindergarten next week. Uh, oh. Um, she got the first three attenuated shots and should get the fourth one in a month. I do intend to give her the oral vaccine as well, but I'm not sure whether it's better to wait for the fourth attenuated vaccine or do it sooner before she goes to kindergarten. Any advice? Wait, kindergarten at 11 months? Yeah, I guess in it must be different in Israel. We we For us, kindergarten starts at five years. I would say this is preschool. But this is probably, kindergarten might be a way of talking about daycare. This is probably yeah. what we would call daycare or preschool. Right. Yeah, right. All right, so get, got the first three uh, atten- inactivated shots, which, by the way, is not an attenuated virus. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's an inactivated virus. Um, I don't think it matters because um, the inactivated vaccine is not going to interfere with gut right. take of the infectious vaccine. So here in the U.S., before we switched to the inactivated, there was a period of combined inactivated and then Sabin vaccine. I think they were giving one or two doses of inactivated and then the full course of the Sabin vaccine. So my view would be that it doesn't matter. Right. Right, because the gut immunity isn't going to be affected by IPV. Yeah, and as long as you're getting your annual smallpox vaccine. uh, (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Oh, no, different letters. So So what we haven't said so far. So the idea is used to do oral vaccination. The, The Israelis monitor their sewage for polio, right? That's right. They used to do the uh, immunize with the oral vaccine. Then you'd probably find vaccine virus in the sewage, I'm assuming this. Correct. You should but definitely uh, find but it, yeah. no wild-type virus or very little. Correct. Then you ch- uh, uh, switch to the inactivated vaccine, and I would assume what happens is that the uh, 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 vaccine virus that used to be in the uh, sewage will disappear down to a background or Mm -hmm. zero level and there will be no wild type but now wild type is cropping up and it makes people nervous and the reason for that is that the uh, inactivated injected vaccine does not induce gut immunity correct you're immune to uh you're you're not going to get paralytic disease you're not Mm -hmm. even going to get serious polio disease but wild type virus can still you can still get it and it will replicate some in the gut and you will shed it so that's that's So you can be effectively a carrier. So that's always been a fear of using strictly the inactivated vaccine is that if there's still wild-type virus circulating, even if you've been vaccinated with the inactivated vaccine, you can carry and still support, uh, as a population, replication of the wild-type virus. And that this is really very interesting because it appears that that is, in fact, what's happening. So now you go back in with the oral vaccine to see if you can wipe that out and we're playing whack-a-mole. Here. Well, the problem is if you have if you have pockets of people who are not being immunized, as he implied here in Israel, they can they'll pick up the wild type virus that's circulating in the guts of the uh, IPV immunized right. people. Right. So now that's why it's set. important to go in with OPV, which will prevent spread of wild viruses, even if you immunize fewer than a hundred percent of the population. Right. Now, that's the- that's the logic in going into Israel with OPV. Now, theoretically, if you were able to vaccinate the whole world and get 100% coverage with the inactivated vaccine, would you eventually eliminate the wild virus? Or is that going to simmer along replicating in people's guts? I think it could still simmer along and replicate in guts for sure. Well, we know that um, anybody who got the oral vaccine while immunosuppressed uh, could potentially continue secreting yeah. live virulent virus, in fact, because it reverts in the gut for years. Yeah. So if you if you did go to the inactivated vaccine and you covered 100% of the world and you kept doing that until all of your chronic secretors died off, yes. then you would have eradicated the virus. That's going to be a generational thing, though, and you'd have to get full uh, So wait a minute, back up again. I've, so what I have to do is I have to get universal coverage with the oral vaccine to the point where the wild type virus is gone and then back off on the oral vaccine or replace it with inactivated. You'd have to replace it with inactivated. What the WHO is currently claiming they're going to do is get everybody with the oral vaccine and then stop vaccinating and hold their breath and hopefully nothing bad will happen. Hmm. So the the assumption is that if you switch to IPV, eventually you will get the, the, the circulating viruses will go away. Yeah. 
that's an assumption because the guts are still susceptible, as we see here. Right. Yeah, you have to wait for all the guts that were of that generation that might have been exposed to the virus to cycle out of the population. And the idea would be that mm-hmm. if it's in sewage, it's going to have a half-life and it'll eventually go away. Right. Now, the problem here is that we still have wild viruses circulating in Nigeria and Pakistan and Southern Afghanistan. Sudan. So that's the origin of these viruses in Israel from people traveling. And so I suspect, now we don't look in the U.S. to see if there is polio in the sewage, but I bet if we looked, we would find it because our guts are all not immune, or m- many of us are not immune to right. uh, to polio. So well, we don't look because as Mark Palanche said at the same uh, meeting, uh, Rich, you have to be prepared to explain your findings. And if you're not, you shouldn't look for them. You shouldn't look. (laughs) That's right. So uh, I just want to back up even further for any newbies that are listening to this and make sure that we're clear on this. The, uh, what we're calling the oral or live vaccine are uh, polio viruses representing the three uh, relevant serotypes that have been uh, crippled so that they can still infect you. And this is in generally the case with a live, what we call a live uh, vaccine. They can still infect you and replicate so you get the whole spectrum of virus infection, but they're crippled to the point that they don't cause disease. Whereas the inactivated is the wild type virus uh, that has been grown up and then treated with something like formalin uh, to fix all the proteins and fix the nucleic acid and that kind of stuff. So that's just a virus particle that is injected into somebody, and you make antibodies to that. So that's a, a different a different type of immunity in in, in a way, okay? Yeah, it's definitely uh, it, a different type of immunity. And, in fact, when you said you get the full-blown polio infection, you also get a much more complete immune response to, right. the, to a live virus vaccine. Right. And, and there are advantages and disadvantages to each, many of which we've just been uh, discussing. One of the uh, disadvantages of the live vaccine is the pos- in particular in the case of polio, is the possibility of reversion of the mutations that make it weakened back to something that uh, is not weakened. And that's the reason we got rid of uh, uh, oral polio vaccine in this country and some other countries, is that we'd reduced the burden of paralytic polio to the point where the only polio we were seeing was from uh, uh, revertance of the virulent uh, strains or from people associated with people getting the uh, uh, the oral vaccine. Right. So it's, it's, the, it's, the, the in- only, it's the only vaccine that's in general use that can that can actually give you the disease that's supposed to prevent. Right. Um, I mean, that's that's true. That's a, a, a legitimate criticism of it. It happens in, what, one in two million or something cases. Mm. It's very, very rare. Um, but if you get... Uh, it, it, it turns out that probably everybody produces virulent revertant viruses in their gut after they're vaccinated with OPV, mm-hmm. um, but uh, it doesn't go to the neurological infection because by that time the immune system is kicked in and it takes it out. In one in a million or less people, um, something hasn't quite gotten geared up with the immune response or the virus reverts faster or something, uh, possibly to do with the gut microbiome, we don't really know. Um, and those people develop polio. They get paralyzed. They, you know, they have they have genuine paralytic polio, and that's um, when you've gotten to the point where you don't have wild polio circulating anymore. That becomes the downside. And then, especially in a developed country where you can actually distribute an injected vaccine, it makes sense to switch to the inactivated. And at the point where we switched in this country, that uh, burden amounted to about ten cases of paralytic polio a year. Mm-hmm. And that was enough uh, to to in this country to switch from the uh, oral to the uh, inactivated vaccine. Right. But the inactivated vaccine has the disadvantage we've been talking about in that it doesn't give you immunity in your gut, so you can still cook wild type polio in people who have been uh, immunized with the inactivated vaccine. And in developing <laughs> countries, the inactivated vaccine has the huge disadvantage that you need a medical infrastructure to distribute it that doesn't exist there. And it's more expensive. And it's more, it's, it is more expensive, yes. All right. Uh, continuing with this letter. <laughs> Three, 
Uh, or, um, yeah, I understand the contribution of getting the oral vaccination from the population point of view, but what should I tell my friend who asks my advice and doesn't care about the population? He only cares about his own kids. Tell him he needs to care about the population. I, I'm just, I, I'm in an intolerant mood here. I'm not, I'm not going to put up with that kind of stuff. Well, and also, you can tell him if there's wild polio there in Israel, he should be getting it for his kids. Yeah, yeah. exactly. He's going to protect his kids. Yeah, uh, odds are that you need to get the, the oral vaccination if you've got wild polio circulating. Yep. End of story. And it's a very effective vaccine. There is a very, very tiny risk uh, associated with it, um, but it's a very effective vaccine. Unfortunately, the, I, the risk is what people are worried about. The risk is what people right? obsess over, but yeah. then people go out and they take risks that are far greater and they think nothing of it. Mm. Um, you know, I got OPV, uh, everybody of my generation did, and if they had still been giving it when my kid was coming up, I would have given her OPV. So I, I don't know how much this makes a difference, but when my three kids were um, given OPV, we had a choice between IPV or OPV, and the pediatrician, who actually was an adjunct professor here at Columbia, she said, you want OPV, don't you? I said, of course. <laughs> But uh, she said a lot of people are choosing the other way. But I think I knew there was a risk, and I think I, it was worth taking. So, All right. Uh, thanks again for educating me, and yes, also for making me laugh out loud on the bus. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, Dixon, can you take the next one, please? I will try my best. So uh, this is Ilker? I think so. Dear Vince, Vincent and Alan, thank you very much for coming all the way here to Harvard and recording another great episode of This Week in Virology. Both Ayusu and I, she is a PhD student in genetics and I'm a PhD student in virology, are thrilled to have had the chance to meet you guys in person today. <clears throat> As we mentioned after recording, our own science podcast for the Turkish-speaking general public, Bilim Kazani, English translation is The Cauldron of Science, that's a great title, is very much inspired from your efforts. It was a pleasure to tell you about our own show when we try to mix humor and science to the best we can to make the latter more accessible and enjoyable to the general public. Our motto is, science is a cauldron, we are the ladles. Um, <clears throat> which reminds me of a bad joke, but I won't even talk about that. It is based on a Turkish idiom generally used to refer to the exploration of, say, a ge <laughs> geographical area, as in, I strolled around in New York, New York was a cauldron, I was a ladle. <clears throat> By the way, who was that ladle I saw you out with last night? That was no ladle, that was my knife. I, uh, we liked the oh. idea of applying this to science, <laughs> i.e. explore a wide range of topics from a scientific perspective, parens, some of them unfamiliar to us as well, do our research and talk about both established and cutting-edged findings in those fields to the general public. As you mentioned, a solid immunity a solid community, I saw the solid immunity, I would be better. Solid community of Turkish scientists exists outside Turkey, but we feel it is important to, bridge, to build bridges between this community we also belong to and the people of Turkey. On another note, we were also very pleased to hear that you know many other Turkish scientists in the United States, like Oya uh, Chingos, <coughs> who took the current events in Turkey to their heart and have been very active in the protests. However, Gizi Park protests that have come to the international spotlight to the past two months are merely isolated events. They were most of the they were most of the results the result of a longer-term authoritative political agenda of the current government, which Turkish scientists were not immune to either. We document our efforts to support a free ac academy and an open democracy in Turkey on science for Gezi to oppose that agenda. Our efforts to raise awareness on these issues were also joined by John Bonanum of Science Magazine, who in the past two months has extensively covered the state of the Turkish academy, that over the years has been gradually ripped off of its independence. If you could uh, possibly give these articles a nod and help us further raise awareness, we would appreciate it immensely. Again, many thanks for your inspiration and for your efforts to spark an interest in science among non-scientists and scientists alike. Looking forward to crossing our paths again in the future, be it for purposes of communicating and or doing science. Best, Ilkers, Aztap, and uh, Yasu, uh, Yugo, if that's the pronunciation. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your names. That's a good photo of us at Harvard. Yeah, it's yeah, very it's great. Nice. It's the <coughs> one that someone else took of us. 
And I'm sorry that it's taken so long to read this email, guys, but uh, we'll put all those links in the show notes. Um, at Kathy, can you take the next, I guess you should do the next two because the first one is... Really uh, short. Short. <laughs> Johan writes, really glad you decided to make a Google Hangout and post the video. Just makes it so much better to watch with the video compared to just audio. Greetings from Sweden. And then John writes, Dear Twivers, I was just listening to Twiv246, where you were discussing the huge Pandora virus. This made me wonder about where viruses came from and whether there are examples of intracellular parasites in the process of evolving toward becoming viruses. For example, are there examples of intracellular bacteria that send mRNAs out to the host ribosomes or send DNA into the nucleus? I know from TWIM that bacterial endosymbionts can sometimes lose most of their working genes and that bacteria can even make a kind of shell when they sporulate, though I don't know how similar this is to making a capsid. Is this a plausible way for some viruses to have evolved, or are there reasons to think it would be just too hard to get from an independent organism down to genetic material plus enzymes in a protein shell? To my amateur mind, it seems like Pandora virus and Mimi virus might be somewhere on that kind of path downward from independent organism toward virus, but I'd love to know what you guys think. Thanks for your wonderful podcasts, which keep teaching this computer scientist more and more about the living or almost living world. <laughs> <laughs> Good uh, clarification. Uh. So I asked a colleague of mine, Mario Reardon, who works on intracellular bacteria, about this question about uh, whether intracellular bacteria ever use the host ribosomes or send their DNA into the nucleus. And while she didn't provide me any examples of that, she did point out that uh, some obligate intracellular parasitic bacteria uh, in the chlamydialis order can't synthesize nucleotides. And so they have this so-called sophisticated metabolic parasitism so that where they import NAD and other nucleotides. And then there's environmental chlamydia, and they seem to encode five transporters, but the human pathogen, Chlamydia trachomatis, encodes only two, uh, which apparently have taken on the functions of importing all of the uh, five nucleotides. I think I left out UTP in my example here. Um, suggesting that uh, during reductive evolution, the pathogenic Chlamydia lost individual transporters. So it's not exactly uh, answering John's question, which I think is a creative uh, way of thinking about evolution of viruses um, and intracellular parasites. but uh, Well, the, it's one of the ideas for the origin of viruses, of course, that they, they separated from cells at some point. The problem is we can't, it happened so long ago, we can't track it by mm -hmm. looking at sequences. And the Pandora viruses, in fact, are so different that it's been proposed that they evolved from a fourth domain of life, which is extinct. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's hard to prove because it's no longer <laughs> around. <laughs> right. But, you know, there's so, there's so f little nucleotide sequence identity or homology between viruses and cellular genes, it's hard to prove that. I mean, there are some, there's signatures of like polymerases and ATPases and so forth that are, that are conserved. But you can't say, aha, this virus came from this cell. Like you can say, this mitochondria came from bacteria. Yeah, right. we don't have, and we haven't found any um, any good transitional forms yeah. that would catch this in the act, and it, it, that may just be a product of uh, sort of a punctuated equilibrium where <clears throat> you go through these maybe you go through these transitions very rapidly. Yeah. So you're an intracellular bacterium, and then next thing you know, you're a virus, and that might be a very quick step, uh, or it might happen in the other direction. Um, so it's it's very hard to um, to figure that out. I think these these transitions have happened long ago, right? They probably well, yeah, certainly some of them did. So you think there's any? I mean, do you think anything is going on right now, which would be from a cell to a? I don't think. Well, so, evolution right? never yeah, sleeps. Everything's going, so, everything's going on right now. That's what I was going to say. Everything's going <laughs> so on. That's, would, a that's to show. Everything time. is going on right now. 
Okay. Well, you can think about some places where things aren't going on. Yeah, there are, yes. <laughs> yes. So in some, in some respects, Mary does uh, answer the question in that we have an expert here who says, I can't think of any examples that fit exactly these criteria right. at mm-hmm. this point. Doesn't right. eliminate yeah. that that's a possibility. Yeah. Yeah. And I must say that uh, I, when I think about this idea of evolution of viruses, what comes to my mind is uh, transposons and other mobile elements. Because uh-huh. I don't think you necessarily need to have to postulate a bacterial intermediate to this. There are pieces of DNA that jump around from locus to locus, and sure. uh, in that, in the, in a segment of genetic information, also encode the genes to do that. And so all you, all you really need is to encapsulate that and get it away to get out of the cells and get into other cells, and you have a virus. Now you could argue that those transposons or mobile elements were viruses. I mean, it probably goes both directions. Uh, but I don't think you necessarily have to postulate some more complex organism. I think you can start with just something as simple as mobile genetic elements and uh, uh, make a virus from that. Sure. Yeah, that's the other way. Absolutely. All right, Rich, you're next. David writes, gives a link. Uh, based on what I've just learned in week three of the Coursera class, I read this and said, yeah, and... The article makes this discovery sound like a new finding, but it seems like the wheel has been re- reinvented. I'm sure my newbie eyes missed something. Is this really news? Uh, what is this? I haven't looked at this. I'm sorry. This is the uh, Semler et al. paper identifying the enzyme that removes VPG from picornavirus RNA wow. as a cellular DNA repair protein. Okay. Um, it, you know, the, it's actually uh, the enzyme that removes uh, intermediates when telomerase is linked to uh, DNA or RNA. And the problem is, it's a great finding. We talked about it on TWIV 210. Almost a year ago. Wow. Well, yeah. How fast time goes. I mean, this is a great story that this enzyme, which had been elusive for years, turns out to be there in the cell with a known function. Unfortunately, the title of this article, <laughs> Microbiologists Find New Approach to Fighting Viral Illnesses. It's just absurd. Yes, absurd. <laughs> I yeah. mean, it doesn't give you the cool result at all. I mean, this sounds like what you would write in your abstract of your grant proposal. We can use this oh, target. Oh, you write to- that in the abstract of the grant <laughs> proposal that comes to me. You get points off, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay, because I, you know, I don't want to hear that garbage. I know. Right? I want to hear the experiments. Right. So that's you know, the to be honest, this has actually even gotten a little old in the news business. Yeah. Um, if you, if you, uh, most editors, if you pitch an idea for an article that this. This could help discover a new mechanism for fighting disease. They're going to look at you and say, yeah, yeah right. <laughs> so can everything else. Right? <laughs> I know. So that's the problem here, David. It's a cool finding, but the article is... is uh, it, it is. Uh, well, okay. So it is not an approach to fighting viral illness. Potent, there are a number of different viruses that use VPG in their... Rac- there's a whole family, you know better than I do, uh, Vincent. So theoretically, the cellular enzyme that cleaves that off could be a target for antivirals, right? That would be Mm -hmm. maybe. But it has a function in the cell. All right. But we don't know if inhibiting that enzyme would be harmful to the cell. That's the problem. We don't know if it would work against the virus. So that is a totally inappropriately blown up title. And also, if you make a list of all of the big barriers to developing new antiviral drugs, shortage of potential targets doesn't appear on it. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. There are plenty of targets. All right. Next email is from Peter. Dear professors, I was talking to a friend who is a retired pedigree cat breeder about virology. A little little sentence rearrangement required. She was telling me about feline coronavirus, a usually mild infection, but which in some cases can mutate to cause the potentially lethal feline infectious peritonitis, a leading infectious cause of cat death. And here is a link to a site and also to recent work from Cornell, who have announced that they know where the mutation occurs, which should lead to all sorts of new tests and possibly treatments. (laughs) Here we go. (laughs) So this is from the laboratory of Gary Whitaker at Cornell. And yes, uh, these this virus, the uh, feline corona, actually undergoes 
mutation within the infected cat to become this uh, more pathogenic strain, and uh, it's a pretty cool story. Was Am I correct that the mutation has to do with the uh, virus attachment protein? Yes, that's right, the spike glycoprotein. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And um, I think it affects fusion. I believe that that is the, um, and it allows it to fuse in different cells. Anyway, I was wondering if it would be possible to have an episode of TWIV dedicated to veterinary viral diseases. Wow. Let's get Colin on. Yeah, yeah we could get Colin. He would be cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You talk about his parvovirus uh, story. Uh -huh. There's also someone in our uh, ASV council who's a veterinary virologist. She, uh, yes. she would be good, too. Mm -hmm. I forgot her name. Uh, I had Veronica. Veronica. <clears throat> Veronica. In, in another yes. life. That'd be very good. My family uh, had a cat, and the cat died from feline infectious peritonitis. Oh. Oh. His name was Ahab. Oh. Ahab? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Ahab the cat. Wow, nice name for a cat. I thought yeah, so. Nice name for a cat. I thought so. Yeah. This article uh, is in Emerging Infectious Diseases, Correct. so that's a public uh -huh. access journal that if people want to read it, they can take a look at it. Yeah, and also after after poo pooing this thing about uh, potential treatments, um, it, it is important to point out that you do need to know the background biology of stuff in order to be able to treat it. So yeah, this is a step kind of in that direction, but it doesn't mean that uh, treating this disease is around the corner. Hey, EID is still up. Yeah, I was surprised. No. Wow. Well, if it's, um, <laughs> it depends on how much maintenance the site requires. They may not update with a new edition. Yeah, I mean, there's no right. new papers, but yeah. all the old ones. Yeah, stat will... static sites can stay online and even even blogs and such, but um, but if it requires anybody to come in and fix anything, then mm. it's not going to happen. It's your turn, Alan. Scott writes, Vincent et al., thanks once again for one of the most interesting as well as entertaining science podcasts out there. I ran across this item on the NSF website. Uh, I'm going to click the link and hope that it's there. <laughs> no. Uh, no. Uh, okay. So. <laughs> so sorry. Um, <laughs> so I can tell you what this paper is about. The article didn't answer my questions, so I'm asking the experts. Well, it doesn't answer my questions either. <laughs> so I should just point out, the URL now directs to a generic page about yes. NSF and the shutdown yeah. of the government. So that's why we're all uh, frustrated. Yes. <laughs> I remember what this was about, though. Do you want me to want this? Yeah, if you, yes. what was... So this was an interesting um, study of a dengue outbreak. I forget where. Where... Apparently, a defective virus, so a dengue lacking a piece of the viral genome, was um, being propagated along with wild-type dengue virus and was exacerbating the disease. Hmm. Okay, so this is very interesting because I don't know of many examples where defective interfering or not interfering, defective viruses do that. So... That's what this is based on. This was actually complete news to me. I'd never heard of that before. Defective enhancing particle. Or it something. could be, yeah. It seemed to be enhancing the <sighs> disease, yeah. Hmm. So by itself, this defective dengue virus will not replicate in a cell because it doesn't have essential genes. Right. But if co-infected with the wild-type virus, it will. And apparently, this was going from person to person along with the virus and making their wow. disease worse. Huh. Wow. The only, uh, the only example I can think of that's, in, well, no, I was thinking of uh, hepatitis delta virus, but that's not even related to Hep B. Right. Uh, that's an, uh, that's a, a passenger right. Right. that exacerbates disease, but it's not related to the, to the parent virus. Right. right. So okay. Scott's questions. Uh, one, would it not be possible to create a vaccine against this mutant virus and at least use it to attenuate the virulence uh, and transmissivity of the normal dengue strain as a result? Well, I, you basically, if you made a vaccine against dengue, it should take care of this because it has the exact envelope glycoproteins as okay. uh, the wild-type virus. The deletion is in a non-structural protein region of the genome. So I, okay. I, if a dengue vaccine should take care of it, I would think. Yeah. Yes. Right? Right. Okay. Yep. So second, if such a vaccine was created, how likely is it to exacerbate the problem with hemorrhagic dengue in subsequent infections with mm. different strains? Well, that is the problem with dengue vaccines, isn't it? Yep. Um, well, the, the thing is here, if you made a tetravalent dengue vaccine that protected you against infection by all four right. serotypes, then you should not have the antibody-mediated enhancement. Right. 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 And that's the goal. Yeah. That's and, the, and, right. And in, an interesting... Part of that is getting that immunization so it's really a balanced immunization against all four strains. Right. right. 
that seems that said. Because if, if there's significant imbalance <laughs> yeah. in the in, in, immunization, then you're uh, you're back to the hemorrhagic fever problem. So I, I talked with Jeff Almond earlier this year. He works at Sanofi Pasteur Vaccines, and they have a tetravalent dengue vaccine out there. It's based on the yellow fever backbone. They've taken the glycoprotein of of dengue and put it into that virus backbone. They've done a clinical trial. They're in phase two. They've they've completed phase two, hmm. and or maybe they've completed phase three. The the people who are immunized made great protective responses against serotype one, three, and four, Oops. but oh. not two. So in this interview, and I'll post a link to this interview with him. I said, "Aren't you worried that?" This is going to <laughs> right. cause a problem when they get. He said, "Well, yes, we are worried about this." Yes. Dear, dear, so, oh dear. So that's it's weird that why type two? Right. Why don't you get a right. new? Yeah, and, and I think that's not the only time that that kind of thing has been observed. There's, there's type two is peculiar in this way. Right. Uh, third, since this strain is incapable of reproducing in the absence of co-infection, does it offer the potential of a vaccine against dengue virus type one or possibly other strains? My thought is that if a similar mutation could be introduced into all three other strains, perhaps it could be used as a vaccine against all four types simultaneously, neatly sidestepping the problem of hemorrhagic dengue and creating a universal dengue vaccine. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, the problem you, have is to, you, have have, you have to have a way to grow it. You could do yeah, that. Because it's defective. <laughs> but that's the, generally the idea behind creating an attenuated vaccine. Yeah. Now, the problem is it's not going to propagate in the host who's immunized, right? Because it's that's defective. Right. That's correct. So it's going to be a one cycle. It's going to be basically like an inactivated mm-hmm. virus right. vaccine. And I don't, you know, so it's a good idea. It could be done. But I think the companies are pursuing the attenuated approach. Yeah. Or inactivated. So, I, But, yeah, in principle, it should be okay. Uh, here in <clears throat> here in Costa Rica, where dengue is endemic, we're in the midst of our worst ever dengue outbreak, so severe that the State Department has just issued a travel advisory. Due to global warming, dengue is now appearing at altitudes where it has never been seen, as high as 5,000 feet. Anything that can be done to halt the spread of this terrible disease would be of huge benefit to millions throughout the tropical and increasingly the temperate world. Regards from rainy Costa Rica. Dixon, yes, sir. global warming? Why not? <clears throat> sure, that's how so you. So that makes the uh, allows the mosquitoes to live sure. higher. Sure. No, that's right. right. I, they've noticed the same thing for malaria transmission in uh, Kenya. But they, people say global warming isn't real. They do say that, don't they? But those, this, those people are. Let idiots. them live. Let them live at the five thousand foot mark. <laughs> yes, and let see them live they're... at the five thousand foot mark and, and watch the dengue. They show can up be the sentinel animals. And the glaciers disappear. That's exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. Dixon, it's your turn. It's so. So it is. Sal writes. Dear Dr. Racaniello, okay, everybody else, you don't have to listen. I am behind on my TWIV listening, but I just listened to episode 211 where you said, and I quote, dinosaurs were the dumbest, but they lived 140 million years. I am not a paleontologist, although that was my first career aspiration at age five, I might add, but an interested amateur. However, I know enough now to know that both halves of that statement are false. <laughs> Dinosaurs have existed since the Triassic, and yes, they still do exist, although the extinction event at the end of the Cretaceous killed most branches on their evolutionary tree, but not all. They fly around and crap on your car. (laughs) I'm not altering this email at all, by the way, so the words of the reader don't necessarily express the... uh, Birds are a small branch of theropod dinosaurs, closely related to... Um, Troodontids. Tr- Troodontids and uh, dromaeosaurids. Dromaeosaurids, for example, in Velociraptor. I, I have an eight year old, so I'm. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> and slightly less closely related to Ov- Oviraptorosaurus. Therese- take it, Th- Alan. <laughs> Therizinosaurids. <laughs> yes. Ornithomimids. And Tyrannosaurids. Note that all of the above families contain demonstrably feathered species. Now, realizing that birds are living dinosaurs, we can consider whether they were the dumbest. Of course they aren't. Alex the parrot and parrots and corvids in general have shown that many birds are quite intelligent. Even extinct dinosaurs can occasionally be studied in terms of at least brain size and shape, showing that their intellectual gifts, for theropods at least, range from crocodilian level to average modern bird level. Incidentally, there is evidence of parasitic infection of T. rex, known as Sue, who may have had a trichomonas infection on her face and throat. And then it says, 
Also, could you give an image for this show if you need one? No. No, that's Kathy that's said Kathy. this. I'm sorry, Kathy <laughs> says. It's Kathy yeah. speaks. Right, okay, I'll give you an image. I will read on below that. Despite the infection, an injured shoulder, broken ribs, gout, and arthritis, <laughs> Sue lived to the ripe old age of 28, making her the oldest, largest, and most complete T Rex specimen we have. Not bad for an apex predator who had to hunt, scavenge, or starve. That probably required a bit of brain. I like this picture from the paper of the T Rex with Trichomonas on its face. That's right yeah. now. That's what you're talking about, Kathy, <clears throat> right? Yeah, yeah. By the way, Alan Gold, who was a colleague of mine here for many years in biochemistry's son, worked at the uh, Museum of Natural History in Chicago and purchased Sue for that museum. All right, so I, I meant the big guys who lived. Way back when the Bronx, uh, <laughs> I know, which you know, I understand that birds are descendants, <laughs> but the big guys lived a long time. The sauropods they had really small brains right. in relation to their body size. Now I understand there's been a renaissance in the evaluation of their <laughs> intelligence, <laughs> and I admit that. But it's just an example that the dumbest things don't mess up the world, so they live longer, right? Okay, but this is cool. That, we're we're uh, still no, going to get angry letters from uh, dinosaurs. I think the yeah. dumbest, the, uh, Vincent. I think you're dead wrong on this one. The dumbest people mess up the world the most that's what i'm gonna say because they're well, unaware so of the, what they're the, doing the opposite is humans who are supposedly yeah, the most exactly. intelligent and we're ruining the world right? yeah but yeah that's true but anyway that's, that's cool true. sal thank very, you very much we appreciate it that was a nice romp yeah. through the past uh, kathy you are next joe writes sounds like ian needs to borrow jacques cousteau's boat and anchor it and anchor it offshore in the mediterranean to avoid all the border crossings <laughs> great work tracking this mystery virus Mm. Regards, Joe. So this relates to uh, Ian Lipkin's story about trying to get his samples out in, in one piece or in still mm. frozen right. back to New York. That's the MERS, MERS stuff story. off yeah. Saudi Arabia, right? Right. Why don't you take, out, you should take the next two, actually. Okay. Robin writes, open access explained. Check out this video on YouTube. And this is a great video. Uh, it's by yeah. the PhD comics mm -hmm. uh, artists. <laughs> So it's really worth work, uh, looking at. Um, so the link is there. Next one is from Shali, who writes, Vincent et al., I'm a couple weeks behind, just finished listening to the textbook podcast. I love the podcast. It is the closest I get to a journal club nowadays, which brings me to my question. How do you do it? Academia, that is. <laughs> I'm scrambling to assemble labs and syllabi for fall, write up a grant proposal, draft an accreditation report, do some bench work in bioinformatics, and trying to keep up with a passel of bright undergraduate researchers. I am not whining. I love the work, but I feel like I can't do justice to any of it without adopting out my kids. <laughs> I can't, of course, afford a nanny. You guys seem to be doing all of this while gracefully reeling off podcasts and going to lots of conferences and revising a textbook. Suggestions? I have pretty much maxed out my caffeine consumption, so don't go there. <laughs> Thanks, Shelley. And she says, I'm on the coast of Maine, where it is, of course, foggy and 70... 17 degrees C, 65 Fahrenheit. It is supposed to get back up to 80 Fahrenheit by the weekend, though. <laughs> so, um, well, and maybe the next one, too, from Amy. So this whole mm. thing about how can you do it all. Yeah. Dear Twiv, I enjoyed episode 245 about the writing of Principles of Virology. My question is about the time commitment you all make to write and edit this textbook. As a junior faculty member, I am mired in the world of dividing my time between teaching, research, and administration. One of my worries is always where salary support will come from and where my time is dedicated. How much time do you dedicate to working on this book? How often do you meet in person and for how long? How long do each of you spend individually working on the book? Is there a financial incentive for you to write this book? <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out where authorship of this textbook fits in with your other obligations. Running a lab, writing papers, writing grants, institution committees, etc. In general, I would really appreciate more comments from Twiv and guests about how to efficiently dedicate time to the most critical areas of the academic career. I believe this would be of use to postdocs and junior faculty. Regards, Amy. Goodness. As I said before, I purchased the unused time of others. <laughs> <laughs> I think part of the issue is that we are all senior well, except for Alan, I guess. Yeah, but he doesn't count. Cause I don't. I don't have this grant writing problem or anything. We're senior. We're all rich, and and myself and Kathy are all relatively senior people who have uh, established careers. And I would not do all of this stuff as a junior investigator for sure. No, right? absolutely not. No. no, I didn't write any books until I was tenured. <laughs> and and it, it's also an, a whole concept of 
I, I read someone recently saying, um, I, I used to do, and I get tired of saying I used to do, but I can say that myself. I used to read a lot more primary journals when they came out. I used to do a lot of other um, leisure activities that I don't do now. And it, it's an evolution. And so whatever I used to do, I'm now spending some time doing TWIV or other things. But I still marvel, Vincent, at how you do it all. <laughs> because well, you there's, do several there's always a There's so. always a trade-off, right? Yeah. So I have a very small lab now. I have two graduate students in my lab. I have one grant. And so that takes up a lot less time than when I had Alan Dove in the lab, for example. <laughs> Breaking stuff and screwing <laughs> up experiments, yes. Um, and, you know, it was eight, four, five years ago I started the podcast, and I decided that was worth doing, and I shifted some priorities. Um, I don't do, I don't go to conference, I don't go to uh, committee meetings that much. I, I've really abandoned my department. And he never this, answers his telephone. I don't answer my phone. <laughs> I have really become divorced from my department because I find that all the virology has left. It's all immunology, which is great, but I don't want to be part of that. I want to do some other things. So, But I can do that because I'm tenured. I think the main thing is the family, right? Yeah. I have three mm-hmm. kids, and I don't think I've been so great at juggling you know, time with them. I kind of give them the last bit of time that's left in the day, and uh, so that's really hard. We, you know, My wife and I both work, so we did have a nanny for many, many years, which was essential. I don't know how we could have done it. She's a scientist as well. Not the nanny, my wife, that is. <laughs> so it's not easy, I agree. But uh, I think in the end, what I figure is whatever you feel is important to you, what really you're passionate about is what you should do. Here, here. And, and the hell with everything else. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a couple of comments. First of all, as it's already been said, the emphasis... The professional emphasis changes as your career goes on, and appropriately so. Early on, when you're establishing your research career as an academician, you really have to spend more time on that. You have to spend more time mentoring the students and that kind of stuff. Once the laboratory, if hopefully once the laboratory is established and that kind of stuff, you can back off from that. Uh, my mentoring style is completely different now than it was before. Mm-hmm. Uh, I always uh, the pr- family was always a priority for me, but I had the great fortune of uh, uh, my wife uh, was a, a homemaker. She took care of the kids, and, and that, uh, that made a huge difference, so I didn't uh, have to deal with that. Another thing I would say is that one thing it took me a long time to discover is that in academia, you are the only person who really knows how much time you have and how much time you can spend on all this stuff. If you... People come to you and they ask you to do stuff not knowing how much you have to do. And you don't have to do everything. If you say yes to everything, you will have too much to do. (laughs) All right? That's all true. Uh, And so at some point in time, you have to sit down and, as Vincent says, establish what your – decide what your priorities are and figure out, no, I don't have enough time to do all this. And, and and it's not necessarily my job to do all that kind of stuff. Right. All right. So you, right. you have to figure out what your priorities are and make that structure. And you can get into a, a situation where you have said yes too many times and then you're going to burn out. I didn't do blogging, podcasting, textbook, traveling a lot until way after I was tenured. Right. Right. And yeah, totally as you know, you can start to do that gives you, in effect, the freedom to do other things. Sure. And you should take advantage of that as an academic. What yeah. do you think, Dixon? Well, I've, like I said, I, I didn't even consider writing a book until I had tenure. And the reason for that was that uh, books don't count as peer reviewed articles. Yeah. And, you know, you come up before a, a, a board of uh, people to judge you on creativity. And it's great to say that you're the third author on a five author textbook that everybody reads, but it's better to say that you're the first author on a paper that just came out in, let's say, a high-end journal. Uh, those, unfortunately, will always continue to be high on everybody's list as proof of concept that we're hiring someone who will continue to be productive after they make that decision to keep you forever, which is what tenure turns out to be, basically. So at the end of um, uh, my 
peer review worries about getting all my papers out and making sure my research grants were written and making sure that I went to the right meeting and gave the papers that I thought were important to give and meet all those people to make sure my contacts remained intact and all these other things, uh, everybody here could admit the fact that we could have spent more time with our families. And uh, that is a sacrifice that uh, somehow gets made either to a larger extent or a lesser extent. And uh, many of my colleagues, including myself, have been married more than once. So we know what it's like to lose a family with regards to spending too much time at the bench and not enough time at home. That's an honest admission. And uh, if you have to make a choice, I would always pick the home, uh, even though not necessarily when you're young, you realize that. And uh, sometimes people can give you permission to do things which they're not really giving you permission to do. <laughs> you think they're saying, oh, you go into the lab and make the reputation, and, you're done, and I'll stay home and watch the kids. And, and that's not always going to happen. Uh, so I would just say stay in touch with the people you care about the most. That's that's basically what I'd say. Stay in touch with the people you care about the most and don't sacrifice interpersonal relationships for professional gain. And if you can if you can separate those two things you're you're doing a great job. Your time will come to write books. Your time will come to give review articles. Your time will come to serve on uh, outside committees for other people's uh, careers and I I can tell you, I, only, I made two good decisions while I, after I got tenure to junior faculty who were offered the opportunities to become editors for journals, even. That's another huge burden that you've got, and too young. I said, you're, you, you haven't got tenure yet, and you're going to become the editor of a journal. You're going to burn out on all these papers that you're trying to shuffle back and forth, and you won't have time for yourself. So make time for yourself to make sure your career is set before you set off on these uh, extra, I consider them extracurricular activities, and I've never enjoyed more the contact that I've had with uh, Vincent in these uh, podcasts. At the very beginning, I was privileged to be in on it, and I, I couldn't have done that if I were younger. I'm reminded of the pick that someone made at the TWIV at Penn State. Uh, it was someone's... Yeah, that was my pick. Mm -hmm. Your pick, yeah. and yeah. and the woman also talked about not traveling too much. Yeah. You know, uh -huh. she yeah. limits herself. And even now, I feel myself doing that. Mm. Um, I'm kind of saying, you know, once a month or twice in uh, several months is okay. But if it's more than that, it's starting to get out of control. Um, and so I agree with Rich. You are the one who knows what your time is. Mm. And I never say yes to anything when I'm first asked. I always say I'm going to think about this at least overnight. I usually consult with several people, and then and then I make my decision and and go with that. But you your time is what you know about. When when you're junior faculty, it's hard because people ask you to do stuff, and you it's feel true. like you have to. It's do flattering it. though, too. Uh, I mean, well, you're, yeah, you're honored to be like, asked, right? Yeah, and you feel like you have to do it because you know it's going to yeah, affect yeah. your tenure or something like that. Mm. But uh, uh, no, it may not it, to ask your department not. chair. Is this a good one to do or not? Because yes. Uh, early on, I was I was asked to be on the campus-wide animal committee at the University of Georgia, which meant going out, I don't even know how often, maybe at least once a month, and visiting various farm sites. Right. <laughs> it was a huge time sink, yeah. it, it, just the first time I did it, and I came back to my chair. I had gotten the invitation letter from the university president. I came back to my chair, and I said, <laughs> I'll do anything if, if you can help me get off this committee, because... <laughs> I just can't do this. I don't know anything about sorghum, you know. <laughs> <laughs> or was, do you want to know anything? It about was horrible. <laughs> and he, and he said that's fine. Let's yeah, we can do that. So um, good ep good episode title. Kathy, I don't know anything. I don't know anything about Kathy, I had a great method for getting out of committee work. I just didn't show up. <laughs> oh, you know, if I didn't yeah. like a committee I was on, I just didn't go there. And I said, you know, yeah. he doesn't come that often. We well, should drop him. He goes, good, you just drop me. <laughs> yeah, one way to manage one way to manage your time is to become irresponsible. That's right. Because then people quit asking you. No, you're you're stuff. absolutely. But but choose the responsible committee. That, I'm still on the admissions committee here for our medical school. I would never drop off of that thing. So, you yes. know, pick your fights, as they would say, and be sure you're passionate about it and stay with them. Uh, that pick that we were talking about is uh, called the seven-year postdoc, yeah, uh, and it was ha. in TWIV, TWIV 243. So let me just say a few words about the book, because Amy here wanted mm -hmm. to know um, how much time do you dedicate. So I, usually, I try and only work on the book at night, mm -hmm. so um, 
when my kids are young, that was easy. They went to bed, and I would just work on it. And now they're not young, and they don't go to bed ever, I think. <laughs> so at some point, I say goodbye, right. <laughs> and I go work, and they don't really mind, I think. Uh, when we are doing a new edition, so we just started a few, I think in the spring, working on the next edition. And we have a period of about six months where we meet twice a month in Princeton, we spend a day going over chapters until we get all 20 chapters reviewed that way. I don't know how much time I spend on it. Um, of course, already having the first edition written, then it's a matter of revision. It's much less work. Is there a financial incentive? <laughs> I don't do this for the money because we do get a royalty, but it doesn't compensate us for the time. And my view is that I want to, I, I joined the team originally because I wanted to put out a really good textbook of virology and that's the incentive for doing it so if you do it for money it's not the right it's not the right incentive and it's not going to be a happy situation nope i can tell you that you don't make a lot of money that's one of the reasons <laughs> and as i said how does it fit in with my other obligations i it, my obligations now are, are are much fewer than a beginning faculty member so i could fit it in but if i were not tenured i wouldn't do it all the members of the writing team are tenured, rather senior peeper, people, so yeah. we can fit it in. All right. Uh, Rich Condit is next. He's gone. Okay. No, I'm here. <laughs> I was muted. Uh, Stephen writes, flu vaccine backfires in pigs and gives a couple of links. Uh, one to a Nature News article that is has the same title. And another, uh, I guess you put this in, Vincent, I don't know, to, to the uh, link to the original paper. Yeah. And <clears throat> I've just had a quick look at this. Uh, some of you could probably elaborate, but basically there was a, uh, an experiment done where they were vaccinating pigs with a given flu vaccine and discovered that it enhanced infection with a, a different uh, serotype. Is that correct? Yeah, so they think the vaccine was meant to induce uh, broadly reactive, broadly neutralizing antibodies, and those turned out to make uh, infection worth worse with a heterologous strain. Right, and vaccine-associated enhanced respiratory disease, yeah. VAERD. Uh, so uh, <laughs> this sounds very similar to the dengue thing, though I don't know. I don't see them talking about. Uh, antibody enhanced uptake as a mechanism. Right. I think they do in the discussion mention that it's got similarities to the den dengue antibody enhanced disease, but I don't think they know the mechanism here. And this is just, this is something that's going to happen when you try different immunization approaches, you know, that's why you do it in animals first. And who knows if this would even happen in people, right? Right. But I can tell you it's probably not going to go <laughs> no. to people no. based no. on this result. I don't think so. But um, it is an interesting paper. Uh, Nathan writes, Dear scientists of TWIV, thank you all so much for giving so generously of your time and making such an outstanding podcast. I wish I had a clever way to help you reach more people and compensate you for your contribution to the world. Alas, I do not. However, I recently listened okay, we can move on. <laughs> to exactly. the excellent TWIV 161 discussion of the immune system. That podcast stimulated me to read an interesting paper that might merit discussion on TWIV or TWIM. It's written by former Columbia professor Fred Alt and tells of a fascinating story of how gut bacteria assist in the process of B-cell development. This paper seems to connect two exciting areas of science these days, immunology and the gut microbiome. And indeed, I saw this paper not too long ago. It's called Microbial Colonization Influences Early Bee Lineage Development in the gut, lamina propria. Mm -hmm. And for a definition of lamina propria, go to the ASV TWIV <laughs> and where Christiana <laughs> defined it because Kathy asked her, what's the gut <laughs> lamina propria? <laughs> this is very cool. It shows how the gut microbiome influences B cell development. Sure. Cool. How sure. cool. And I'm not sure which podcast is going to get this. If we do it on TWIV, then our friend Gabriel Victoria has to help us, right? Mm -hmm. That'd be great. Uh, if we do it on TWIM, then, uh, well, that would be hard. So either way, he should help us, but we'll probably do this somewhere. 
Alan, you're next. Okay. Uh, Kurt writes, Hello, Twiv team. I've been a long-time listener to your show, and I have to thank you. Twix makes my two-hour commutes educational and enter- entertaining. I also must say that I'm thoroughly enjoying the virology course on Coursera and iTunes U before it. My question today is this. Are there any examples in nature of viral symbionts with complex organisms? For example, how the Komodo dragon uses not a toxin, but a few really nasty bacteria to bring down its prey in a single bite the need to stalk the prey for days thereafter notwithstanding. P.S. I'm considering a math bio-research major. I was wondering if you guys had any recommendations for second languages that would apply in those fields. I'm already fluent in Spanish, but I'm not aware of any research coming out of Spain or Central or South America. Thanks for your time. Keep up the great work. (laughs) Kurt from sunny California. Learn to read Spanish and you will. Fire and brimstone. Um, Good stuff coming out of Spain and yeah, we just did a great. uh, We did. We just did a great paper from uh, Spain not long ago. But it was not in Spanish. No, no. Um, The um, the languages I would suggest learning with a math and bio major would be uh, C and um, (laughs) R and maybe Java uh, would probably be the language. Seriously. these are these are the languages in which you will be communicating if you if you pursue anything that combines math and biology. Yeah, I don't think you need a, another language for research anymore, right? No, I don't think that's when I was a, when I was a PhD student. They had just lifted the language requirement. Uh, not me. PhD. When I was a PhD student, it was kind of handy to know Spanish. Although in this neighborhood, it, it was um, I, I couldn't understand the Spanish that most of the people around were speaking. Yeah, I think programming is a great idea. Yeah, Fire. I'll tell you if I if I were gonna, I I yeah. learned German and I you know I I've hardly used it at all. If I were going to do it all over again, I'd learn Spanish. Half the world speaks Spanish. And you live in Florida. Yeah, that's, that's true. true too. That is true. Hmm. Viral so, symbiotes, Kathy. So yeah, so we ask about are there viral symbiotes oh, yes. with complex organisms? And I couldn't think of any, but I did think about the fact that some of the bacterial toxins are encoded by bacteriophages. Mm. So uh, bacteria aren't necessarily the complex organisms that you're thinking about, but diphtheria, cholera, yeah, botulinum sure. toxin, all of those are encoded by a phage that then makes that bacteria more nasty because it has the capability of making that toxin. So what about the uh, good viruses, like the ones that make the grasses grow in hot temperatures? And the the wasp uh, polydenoviruses, wouldn't they sort of be symbiotic? Yeah. Yeah, the wasp polydenovirus story is, um, that's a symbiotic. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it's not a, not even sure if it's a virus yeah. anymore. It's a kind right. of, a, it's a gene transfer system. But I think they're probably ones that we don't know about yet, right? But mm-hmm. we're getting there. Okay. Um, oh, we're down an hour and 45 now. You right? have to go pick up your daughter? No, I don't have to do anything. I'm just, I'm just commenting. On, uh, no, we started uh, an hour and. Oh, we started late. Th- yes. Yeah, we started quite late. We started quarter after or something, so we're at an hour and a half. Uh, yeah, not even. All right. Uh, All right, uh, Dixon, you're next. Uh, Johnny writes. Uh, Good afternoon, Tovisians. Rhymes with physicians, extraordinaires. Thank you all for so wonderfully and generously sharing your wit and wisdom, informed and instructive weekly collegial. On conversations. A pure pleasure. Waiting for the next episode is akin, I imagine, to the weekly serial radio programs <laughs> of old with the Lone Ranger, Fibber McGee, and Molly, etc. <laughs> you are forcing the practice of delayed gratification in this immediate, fast paced world. Thanks for that, too. I have three questions two regarding human papillomavirus, HPV immunizations, and the last related to a currently circulating news story. The first has to do with HPV vaccines and the optimal age for administration. While, while back in passing... A while back. I'm sorry. Start that again. A while back in passing, another primary care physician at Boston Children's Hospital said the earlier the vaccine is given, the better the antibody response. Could you please help me understand why that might be true? Currently, uh, Gardasil, licensed starting at the age of nine... Oh, wait a minute. Gardasil is licensed starting at age 9 and extending through age 26. Of all the current vaccines given, patients complain the most about the pain associated with Gardasil, which seems to increase with each booster. Any thoughts why? I've been offering that perhaps it has to do with the pH for lack of a better response. Do you have any ideas? 
Uh, the the pain is associated first. with the adjuvant that's in Gardasil. Uh-huh. There's no question about that. And what is the adjuvant? It's some aluminum salt. It's alum? Let's it's see. Gardasil <clears throat> adjuvant. I will tell you in, in a few moments here. Yes, we're working uh, on that The one. adjuvant is... Is an aluminum salt, yes. Okay, it's, it's like alum. Okay. Now, this, this statement that the earlier the vaccine is given, the better the antibody response. Uh. Now, certainly if you give it to someone over 60, like the flu vaccine gives you a bad antibody, but that's not the age group we're talking about here. Right. My understanding is it's given at age nine because that's when kids will start to get sexually active. It's kind right. of early, but... Right, you, know. you, want to, you want to be sure that you're before sexual activity right. in order to prevent a sexually transmitted disease. Um, but my understanding is um, you want to be as close to that date as you can without going yeah, too late right. because so. you want the, immuni- mm-hmm. the immunity be- to be fresh. That's right. uh, this is a relatively new vaccine. We don't know if the immunity is going to last for 20, 30 years. Right. Um, so if you give it to kids when they're one year old, then yeah. by the time they're 17, 18, or whatever, and they're, they're starting to have sex, um, they may not be fully immune anymore. Yeah. So the idea is you want to do right, it right, right. almost at puberty, um, and that's the goal there, yeah. I think. And those ages, uh, I believe, are set, among other things, because that's the age span that the trials were done in. That's right. right. That's uh, right. right. <clears throat> Here's some other questions. Also, there were some case reports of Guillain-Barre syndrome, perhaps connected with simultaneous administration of HPV vaccine and one of the multivalent meningococcal vaccines. The facts are vague to me, but my practice is to administer Gardasil and Mentactra specifically in separate arms. Always a good idea to put <coughs> different vaccines in different arms. Mm-hmm. I have, I've encountered that throughout my career. However, this association between Guillain-Barre and the dual administration, I think is very... Uh, Problematic. Yeah, I, I'm, it's not yeah. convincing at yeah. all. Okay. Lastly, I would like to bring to your attention a news report about the transmission of Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease among patients having undergone neurosurgical procedures, possibly via borrowed contaminated neurosurgical instruments. Now, this, this may be out of the range of virologists, but perhaps your cell and protein biology colleagues can shed some light on prions. To be colloquial, (laughs) what's up with them? (laughs) Pieces of protein translated from what DNA? From from where or whom? Neither virus, bacteria, fungi, or self? Uh, Where do prions fit into the personal eco-genomic biome universe of organisms? (laughs) That's an interesting way of stating all that. Uh, Who wants to take that one? Anyone could take it. I bet Rich knows all about prions. Well, prions are... Normal proteins in our cells right. uh, that uh, are found, I think, all over the place, but in particular in the brain. Mm. And they can uh, adopt a conformation that is, well, you could put it in quotes, bad. It has a tendency to aggregate and cause uh, a, a big aggregates, uh, uh, their plaque in the brain that's associated uh, with the disease. And what's really weird about this is that that bad conformation is basically uh, catalytically, um, uh, it propagates itself. So if you take a good prion and a bad prion and mix them together, the bad prion can convert the good prion into the bad conformation. So that it catalytically pro- uh, propagates itself. And in that fashion, it's actually infectious. You can take the protein uh, the bad protein and inject it into the brain of an animal that doesn't have any bad protein, and the injected bad protein will convert the resident good protein into bad protein. Right. So it behaves as if it were infectious, but in fact all it is is a protein, and it's a normal protein. There are also um, <laughs> genetic, there are um, inherited versions of this where people have a mutation that uh, uh, promotes the formation of the bad conformation. That's right. about it. Right. right. He sent a link to an article where in the Boston Globe from September 6th. Five patients at Cape Cod Hospital, Cape Hospital, at risk for rare brain disease. So 
They used an instrument that had been used on a patient with a prion disease, Creutzfeldt-Jakob. And uh, the problem with these proteins is that autoclaving will not destroy them. Apparently not. So this has been shown before that you can transmit prion infections by contaminated medical equipment. Yeah. Hard to find them and hard to destroy them. Exactly. We we did a, a twiv on prion. Actually, we've done a couple over the years uh, where this, this the cervid wasting disease of cervids, right, is a prion disease. That's correct. Right. Mm-hmm. We've talked about that. And way back on twiv 12, we talked about prions yeah. in, when they first found it in milk. Right. Cow milk, I think. So. Yep. Talked about it a lot, right? And right. this—it's um, important to note these these patients may have been exposed, right? Um, they didn't. So nobody's true. nobody, as far as I know, nobody's got symptoms yet. Which um, is the only way you can, and that's know. pretty much the only <laughs> way you would know. Yeah, there's no um, diagnostic. So yeah, this was a this was a neurosurgery machine that had been used at one hospital in New Hampshire, and then it was the manufacturer was lending it out. Um, then they lent it out to Cape Cod Hospital, and they used it on some patients, and it was lent to another hospital someplace in another state. Um, but yeah, the concern is that uh, this was used to operate on somebody who had CJD, um, and you can't destroy prion proteins through normal means, so possibility of exposure is there. So you may have, uh, Johnny, you may have heard of mad cow disease. Sure. Cyprion disease also transmitted from cows to people. The cows got it from the feed that they were given. They were given ground up other animals, including sheep that had a prion disease. Mm-hmm. They developed it, but before they developed it, there they were slaughtered, and people ate them. So there was a small outbreak of uh, variant Creutzfeldt-Jakob. It was called in the UK mm-hmm. as a consequence of that. Yep. One of the problems is these diseases. They, originally, when they were discovered, and it was or originally described, the disease was described, and it was thought that they were viral. Right. They were called slow viruses That's because right. it takes That's a right. very, very That's long right. time right. for the disease to uh, disease symptoms to appear. Mm-hmm. No nucleic acid. No. And of course, uh, Stan Prusner received the Nobel Prize for his yep. work on this. Boy, right. nobody wanted to believe him. Yeah. Right, it's true. They say, um, Rich, that only the virologist pay, would pay attention or listen, and that's why, like in all the virology textbooks now, there's a chapter on prions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> even though it's a protein, nobody else would take them. Uh, I'm not sure we we uh, thoroughly answered the because I'm interested in this question in the first bullet point. The hospital said the early this is the HPV mm. vaccine. Hospital said the earlier the vaccine is given, the better the antibody response. Can you please help me understand why that might be true? I'm not sure that is true. No, is it's it? not true. No. It's if you compare okay. 10 to 60, it's true. Right. Okay. But that's not the age group. He's talking about age right. to 20, 9 to, and so I don't know at all why they would say that. Right. Fine, I just want to clarify. Yeah. No, me neither. You want to read the rest? Yeah, you can uh, read it. Okay. Uh, now to update your runner, your running listeners' demographic records. I am a pediatrician in Boston with a private practice in Cambridge. I am also a tutor and an instructor at Harvard Medical School, and I've suggested TWIV to first-year students as well as undergrads. I graduated from Brown, class of 1977, and had the honor of working for about two years in the molecular biology lab of Seymour's Lederberg, Ph.D., Al Dahlberg, M.D., Ph.D., and tangentially with Susan Gerby, Ph.D. Seymour was mapping the genome of lambda phage alpha, as I remember, and I counted, counted, and counted plaques. (laughs) Al Dahlberg was running and staining acrylamide gels looking at ribosomes. I was growing up and didn't realize how fortunate I was. As an aside on my way to my AP Biology and ultimately... MD. David Baltimore's mother was my don for two years at Sarah Lawrence College. Gosh. I remember she mentioned that her son was a scientist, but I had no idea of what his work was. <laughs> I stumbled across Twiv while trying to update myself on immunology and inflammatory response. Heavens to Murgatroyd, who knew what had happened since the late mid-1970s? <laughs> Toll-like receptors, lipid rafts, motor protons, those science animators are great. Again, many thanks for helping me enter the 21st century of molecular and cellular biology, physiology, and immunology. I speak more authoritatively about the myriad viral infections children have and the mild nuisance side effects some get after immunizations as the immune system does its work making antibodies. So much to know, so little time. Stay well, keep your flu vaccine, update your Tdap if you haven't already done so. Sincerely and most appreciatively, John. 
<coughs> Pardon me. Oh. <coughs> I, mean, I know you're going to have to alter that one. By the way, I just got my flu shot yesterday. When did you guys oh, get yours? Oh, dear. We've I got of, mine about a week ago. I'm falling behind. I got mine September 16th. Oh. oh. You win. Whoa. You win. I think I win. <laughs> you win. <laughs> you do. You do. Then he lists two favorite episodes. He says, my favorite episodes so far are episodes 161, Concerto in B, and number 200, Threading the Nidle. I wonder who came up with those titles. <laughs> I can't imagine. The title for Nidal was... Needle. Title? Needle. <laughs> actually, I right. think I'm going to take credit for Concerto and Pete. Uh-huh. Yes, I think actually Rich did do that one. <clears throat> that, that was one of my very few. <laughs> Kathy, you're next. Topher writes, Hey, Twiv team, my name is Topher. I have a Google alert set for new virus, <laughs> among others. You know, just my way of monitoring the viral chatter. Laugh out loud. Anywho, there seems to be a circovirus making the rounds in dogs. Any thoughts? Just checking to see if you guys had any more info. I've never heard of a circovirus. I love your podcast, and I'm currently in San Antonio and strongly considering pursuing virology, up, considering up a virology-related job here. Anyway, take care, guys. Keep up the good work. And so uh, Vincent found the paper again in EID, so that's public access, about uh, this... Uh, dog circovirus, and I didn't read the whole article. I was kind of skimming it. One of my favorite lines is, we named this virus dog circovirus, dog CV, rather than canine circovirus to avoid confusion with the CACV notation used for canary circovirus, canine Khaleesi virus, and capsicum chlorosis virus. <laughs> so, well, that straightened me out, all right? Yeah. <laughs> we didn't need another CACV. <laughs> no, no, words. we actually yeah. didn't. So these are, circoviruses are DNA viruses. They're icosahedral capsids with single-stranded circular DNA genomes of about 1.7 to 2 kilobases. So they're very small. They only really encode small. a few proteins. And this is enough. So they're, they're being discovered more rapidly. Um, you may remember... Circoviruses were found in rotavirus vaccines, and they turned out to be porcine contaminants from the trypsin used that's coming from uh, um, porcine pancreas. And now they're being found associated with other diseases, and this is the first association with dog uh, illnesses. And I should point out that our friend Eric Delwart is on this paper, mm-hmm. and Patty Pesavento. Let's see if anyone remembers the paper of hers that we did. Wasn't hers the uh, the raccoon yep. polyomavirus? That's right. That's wow. right. Raccoon tumor, brain tumors associated right. with the polyoma. So right. this is pretty cool, yeah. Yeah. All right. And, of course, a circovirus would be making the rounds. Ooh. Ooh. <sighs> circoviruses make the rounds. That's a good title. We should reserve that. For when we do a circovirus paper. I just thought they named it because the dog keeps chasing its tail after it catches. Uh, okay. According to this, this virus is is making the rounds. They've, they've got it in lots of different Yeah, uh, it's spreading dogs. all over the place. Yep. I think I it's guess. just chasing its tail. It's gonna, <laughs> exactly. Maybe they'll make a vaccine one day. Right. Um, uh, who just read that? R- Kathy. So Rich is next. Perfect timing. <laughs> Robin writes, for Dr. Condit. And he's got a weather site here that says includes humidity. Right. right? He's even got it. He's got it um, set to, oh, this is the same AccuWeather.com that we've seen before. And he's got it preset to Gainesville, Florida. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> very nice. Um, a shortcut for this and each other host location can be saved on the desktop host screen at Twiv HQ to expedite <laughs> review of the weather. <laughs> Yeah, if I were so organized. I guess you just put the link in the uh, beginning of the show notes. I should. I, I usually. I, yeah, for everybody, right? We could right, put one right. for everyone. Yes. That's a public service message. That's a that good we idea. Offer for free. We'll here. do. <laughs> uh, the next one is from Johnny again, who we just heard from. Right. He sends a link from a uh, publication at Harvard. The, medical school publication or press release called Going Viral. It's an article about Michaela Gack, who is a uh, virologist who has gotten a few awards and uh, describes her work. And in fact, Michaela received a one of the Ann Palmenberg, uh, what is it called? A Young Investigator Award at ASV this year. We heard her give a great talk. 
uh, about her work. So this is a little summary of what she's doing. Cool. She got a couple of other awards as well. So very cool. Congratulations to Michaela. And that brings us to Alan Dove. Mauricio writes, Dear all, I greatly enjoy your podcasts. It makes my waiting time between transcriptions, labeling reactions, and centrifugations <laughs> more pleasant. I enjoy your talks, and even though I'm kind of now of new following your show, I've noticed that uh, given the background of the TWIV team, the podcasts rarely talk about physical virology. By physical virology, I do not mean structural virology, but rather a relatively new field in which physicists and chemists try to understand the physical laws that govern viral assembly, genome packaging and releasing, replication, transcription, budding, etc., as well as some applications like using non-traditional viral vectors for gene delivery, i.e. packaging a replicon from a synbus virus by the plant virus Calpi chlorotic model virus capsid protein to deliver genes into a mammalian cell, which was achieved by a team in my former research group at UCLA, uh, Gelbard and Nobler. I myself was trained during my PhD by them as a physical chemist in trying to understand how the length of single-stranded RNA affects capsid assembly of a very simple positive-stranded single-stranded RNA virus, uh, Calpi chlorotic model virus. Given my experience with other virologists, I think some that some tend to disregard hardcore in vitro experiments. <laughs> I do recognize that whatever is tested in vitro should be later on tried in vivo, but I'm convinced that clean and simple in vitro experiments are extremely useful to understand precise and specific mechanisms and parts of the viral cycle. What's your point of view towards this kind of, kind of virology? I have to say that I think that uh, at least with in vivo experiments and pathogenesis, you're right. It, that kind of study can be messy. It's not nearly as clean and definitive in some ways as in vitro experiments. So I think you've put your finger on the one of the key differences between the two. I think that's how, how we all got our careers going, by doing um, in vitro experiments in cell culture, right? Mm -hmm. You, mm -hmm. Kathy, yep. Rich Condit, myself. Yeah. I think our uh, on TWIV, we tend to focus on uh, in vivo type of experiments, wouldn't you say? We do very yeah. few hardcore molecular biology virus experiments. Yeah. Mm. Well, that's kind of the way the discipline has gone. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, 2025, well, uh, I, I can't keep my decades straight, but t between <laughs> 20 and 30 years ago, when you first went to the ASV meetings in the 80s and 90s, mm. the whole program was about transcription, DNA replication, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. There were no animals in it at all. People were just infecting cells. And I can remember, <clears throat> I'm going to be a little indelicate here, but I can remember in the uh, first part of the 90s sitting on study section and people whining about how people doing pathogenesis weren't getting a fair shake because nobody cared, right? <laughs> now mm -hmm. it's all pathogenesis. That's right. Uh, and nobody does the, except me, nobody does the, you know, <laughs> transcription DNA replication stuff anymore. Um, and it's not done. There's, uh, there's yep. still stuff to do. I've never, I've never done any animal experiments. I think there's still a place for that. Mm -hmm. uh, the paper we just talked about from Bert Semler on the unlinking protein, that's an example of a basic mm -hmm. in vitro cell culture molecular biology result, which we found exciting and you know, there's still some well, of that go on, but um, not a lot. There's there's in vitro, and then there's in vitro. I mean, cell culture. These are is, cell free guys, right? <laughs> I think I think physicists are interested in actual cell free. Yeah, yeah. Reconstruction that's right. from that's right. That's right. from elements, if possible, but uh, really from from the right. protein level. Um, and that that too, I think, was something that virology went through a phase of. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you've got classic yeah. experiments reconstructing. Uh, the you know trying to figure out how phage. replication starts and trying to figure out how um, how phage operates and a lot of that stuff was done um, you know some cool experiments in pure in vitro systems right. often by chemists yes um, and uh, and yeah I think the focus has just has just moved toward what the what the tools are enabling now with um, uh, cell culture and then with animal systems and ultimately getting toward what's going on in people. I think a part of that is, I mean, a good part is the field itself because we've got the tools to do those kinds of pathogenesis studies. But I think a big part is also the desire to do more medically re relevant, yes. quote unquote, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Pressure from funding agencies to do 
more translational type work. So sure, that that was another interesting thing that I learned in chair school. Mm -hmm. Okay, was that uh, there was a little rap about how uh, fundamental research was really important, uh, as if people have been. There's a perception that people have been in a way overreacting to this demand for translational research mm. to the point where uh, they're starting to worry that uh, uh, people aren't really giving the fundamentals the focus they should. This is coming from the uh, director of the Center for Scientific Review. That's it's, great. I love yeah. that. Good. Yeah. So, I mean, he's not, he's saying both are important. Yeah. Yeah. And just right? because, just the, the observation that the field has moved on doesn't mean that it should stay moved on. I mean, there's, yeah. there is still, I'm certain there's still cool stuff to be done from proteins in test tubes. Um, and, and that work does need to be done if you're going to get, you know, the, those kinds of results will ultimately be useful right. in informing what's going on in vivo because the, the in vivo system is so much more complicated and there's so much we don't understand about it. That the more you can, the more you can dissect it out, the better. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's do one more round of, of emails. So, yep. Dixon, you're next. Mm -hmm. Okay. Christopher writes, "Hello, Twiv team. First, I just have to say thank you all for the Twiv Twip Twim trifecta. Your dedication to excellence in science and learning has enriched my life since I discovered Twiv way back around episode 50." I'm a physical therapist working in rural Idaho, and I love to listen to the episodes during my serene commute to work. <laughs> my wife has pointed out many times how odd it is that I listen to your netcasts instead of more relevant ones in my field. Frankly, I have not found any podcast that can compare to all of you all and love to stretch my mind out in its comfort zone. This brings me to the point of this email tonight. My wife said to me that she was checking her Facebook Hey, let's see if those podcasts are doing you any good, and directed me to this story about SIV and CMV and research done at OHSU and by Dr. Lewis Picker. I drew Rich's axiom like a gun and fired back, Slow down, Turbo. Mice lie and monkeys exaggerate. <laughs> <laughs> this led to great discussion about news versus published data, supposition, etc. You know the drill. Just wondering if you had any thoughts, not so much on the news article, but the science. Please see the link below. Thanks so much for your sacrifices of time and effort on our behalf. You are all really making a difference. P. It's the temperature here in Grangeville is an unseasonably warm 77 degrees Fahrenheit with for 10.30 p.m. And although dark, if I strain, I can see some high clouds. Hmm. Thanks again. Yeah, this is a paper that has gotten a lot of press, and I think we should do at a future TWIV. It's about uh, basically a vaccine for SIV in monkeys that seems to clear infection, yeah. which is really a first. So good good uh, find there, uh, Mrs. Christopher, and uh, we'll, we'll do it on a future uh, email. And actually, credit where uh, credit is due here, I learned mice lie and monkeys exaggerate from <laughs> Dixon. Really? Yeah. That's Are the first I heard it. Really? I thought Alan I so. said that. I did, that too. Alan? I think, I think I, it's Alan. It's, I think it's, it's Alan. certainly a phrase I heard no, outside of TWIV, I but I don't Alan. know if it... Okay. All right. I believe well, I learned it on TWIV, and I okay. didn't... Okay. <laughs> it is not original with me. It's something that I that I heard outside of TWIV, and, and I believe I brought it <laughs> you in. You know, we're getting so many titles today. I learned it on TWIV. That's another... I learned it this, on this, TWIV. This might be a song by Gar Simon and Garfunkel. I'll What's go that? look at it at the zoo. This is at the zoo. I, I'll, I'll go back uh, and yes, listen to it. Yes, there is a Simon and Garfunkel zoo song, yes. And I yeah. think that they talk about what animals really do rather than what they actually do. Uh. <laughs> Kathy... Uh oh, sorry. I, uh, I zoomed up because I was uh, okay. recording the title. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for being <laughs> conscientious. I, I, there was a couple that uh, I you're missed, to Mel Melka's letter. Let's see. Oh yes, Micah. Micah. Oh Micah. Hi to the Twiv team. I'm watching you're my right. new favorite weather site right now. Seattle doesn't get many thunderstorms, but I am really appreciating the pick from last week, Weather Spark. And as you can guess, right now it is raining in Seattle. <laughs> My pick of the week is a video that came up on our local news about a marine biology research station. A video put out by Scripps Oceanography really shows the scale of the vessel. Next on my list to do is figure out what sort of research is done on that amazing <laughs> boat. 
Huh. And so uh, Micah sends a link to a YouTube that didn't really have any narration, and um, there were some related links on that same page, and I found a shorter one that has explanatory narration and some views of the inside and tells a little about what it's for. Um, and he also sends a link to an excellent description of the ship from scripts from UCSD. He says, thanks for the endless hours of productive, educating entertainment. And it tells us how to pronounce his name, Micah, like the mineral Micah. And so I can't believe that I was at UCSD for six years and, and even since then. <laughs> and I never heard about this vessel. So I wrote to my friend Sarah French, who Rich also knows, and she's a, a good TWIV listener. And she was an SIO graduate student. And she said she got to go on it a couple of times when it was in port. And it was oh, really cool. Nice. Mm. So nice. check out this video. It's amazing. Oh yeah, yeah. This is a this is a really neat ship. Rich, you're next. Uh, I yeah. I have to start by saying that uh, the Simon and Garfunkel song is at the zoo. Yes, and it's a, vis a visit to the zoo where he anthropomorphizes all of the uh, animals. Correct. Elephants are kindly, but they're dumb. See, antelopes are missionaries. Pigeons plot in secrecy, <laughs> etc. What about dinosaurs? Uh, they're too dumb and they I live think, too long. I think there was anything about so that, that becomes my pick of the week, by the way. So if you're going to ask me ahead of what, time, what the Simon and Garfield? Yeah, that's exactly right. But you had something else today, you know. I, uh, He's got geez. lots of things. You had two up. picks. You got to save like these, up, Dixon. Okay, okay. Boy, you know you're all or nothing, Dixon. I am, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> He's got a shovel uh, full of picks today. <laughs> yeah, Rich Condit. Varun uh, writes, "Greetings, Twiff team." I have been enjoying your podcasts, all the Twix podcasts, and I've probably become smarter than I was, assumption, at the expense of your valuable time. I have a couple of questions that I can't get my head through, and it's probably bothering me, and, I, and <laughs> probably you guys are the best out there for me to query around. One, I recently came to know that individuals producing antibodies against HIV env are more likely to have higher High, higher viral titers compared to people with gag antibodies with the opposite effect. Is there any mechanism uh, that is being known or studied? Insights, please. Um, I have no... I don't know what he's talking about. I wish he had sent a link or something. Yeah, I tried to find something last night and I was not successful. So I don't know either. Two, HIV elite carriers have elevated two LTR circles in the nucleus that cripples HIV uh, integration. Noting from other literatures, I concluded that there is not much difference in HIV replication steps in cytoplasmic events, elites versus non-elites. So is it reasonable to believe that there is some difference in nuclear machinery, probably an enzyme or microRNA, et cetera, that is variant enough to be involved in this difference? Uh, are there any studies enlightening the same? So my understanding is that the elite controllers have an HLA type that is unique. Remember, Rich, the uh, immunology in silico episode right. we did? Yes. Right. So their, their MHCs can recognize a broad range of HIV-derived peptides, and that's possibly one of the mechanisms why they're good at controlling infection. I don't know about this LTR circles thing, sounding no. like an integration issue. So he says they have elevated two LTR circles, but... Once again, I'd need a link to follow I don't that. know this work, right. would be yeah. nice to know it. Three, I would like to know what your comments are regarding the recent Nature publication regarding the SIV-CMV vaccine. Stay uh, tuned. Oh, this is, yeah, this is the one we were just talking <laughs> about. We're going right? to do that. Okay. All right. I also have a pick of the week, Blink. The Power of Thinking Without Thinking by Malcolm Gladwell. Thank you for all your efforts to educate the public and keep virology interesting. All right, Varun, send us some links for questions yeah. in one and two. And our last email, and I guess we're not going to get through all of them. Mm. I had had high hopes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got a little distracted in the beginning. That's we all right. Did. You know, they're all good topics, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Somya Dip writes, Respected Sir, please don't feel I am sending this email to publicize anything. I, the undersigned, is managing director of a group called the We 
the microbiologist, led by a group of young students from microbiology, biotechnology, and other life sciences background. Our motivation is to empower the knowledge among young researchers to develop better research as well as to impart proper knowledge towards society. I am writing you to provide your suitable comments and support to this group, although this is a very new group where it is run by all young students, 20 to 23 years old, but still with wide hope. We look forward for your reply. So he, he or she sends a link to a website called We the Microbiologist, empowering youth knowledge to inspire youth. So this is a group in India, and it looks cool. It looks like a great website with resources, and they have an e-magazine, and it looks like they have a Facebook page. So we'll put the uh, link in the show notes, and everybody can go there. They have a news page. They have an events page. They have a scary picture of you outside of uh, some building at Columbia. <laughs> they do? <laughs> yeah. Where is that? Then, uh, click down a ways, and then it's on the right-hand side. But when you click play, then it just plays through the slideshow. It, it's not like they're talking to you or anything. Is it on the front page? I didn't even yeah, see that. Yeah, So keep going oh, down. Oh, yeah, I see that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. There you are. You just look really serious. Well, I am, you know. Yeah. <laughs> this is how, you are. how viruses work. Yeah. And from what I can tell, Suyumadip is a male. Thank you. Okay. Did you Google that? Uh, yes. All right. So we didn't do too badly here. We only have maybe a dozen or so left, right? Mm-hmm. So that's good. Yeah. So now we can uh, go on to some emails. Let's see. Not emails. Not emails. <laughs> Stop. We just no, did that. I, I don't think we... Didn't we just do that? <laughs> Uh, some picks of the week. Alan Dove, what do you have okay, for us? Okay, um, I have, let me just scroll down and get to the picks. Um, a space weather forecast. Um, <laughs> now I, I stumbled on this just a little while ago. Uh, this is a YouTube channel um, of a scientist named Tamitha Skov. And <laughs> she does these, uh, now space weather is the term for uh, the, the physical phenomena that are going on on the sun that cause things like aurora borealis and, um, uh, you know, these, these solar flares that can affect communication and electrical systems. And, and the sun is very, very active in producing this stuff in a, in a cycle of 11 years. Um, they, when there are more sunspots, you get more solar flares and more of these types of events and more aurora on Earth. Um, so it's, it's hugely influential on events on Earth. Um, but what she's done, which I think is really brilliant, is she does something very similar to a TV weather forecast. She, sta she stands in front of the screen and points to parts of the sun that, you know, in this region is doing this and this region is doing this and that's likely to lead to this. And, and she gives you a forecast for the week for what's likely to go on in space weather for the week. Um, and she knows what she's talking about. She's quite good. Um, she starts off each episode. These are about four minutes long, each one. She starts off each episode usually talking about some some interesting new technology and what effect, um, you know, space weather might have on it. Right. Um, so, gee, this is a cool <laughs> device, uh, um, but it would be susceptible, you know, when, yeah, when right. solar flares come along for this reason and that reason. Uh, and then she goes into, and now here's your forecast for the week. Hmm, it's cool. So nice. I, I think like it's that. a really cool concept. Nice. Very cool. Very. Rich Condit. So this is a pick uh, that I've wanted to do for a long time. It's, uh, I can justify it as a science pick in a couple of ways, um, <laughs> only kind of vaguely, I suppose. But when it was written, the, the pick is 1984, the no novel right. 1984 yep. by uh, George Orwell. Sure. Uh, when it was written, it was a novel about the future, hence sci-fi. But it's really um, social <laughs> satire. Yeah. Um, and it describes uh, what is uh, called a dystopia. The opposite of utopia. It uh, envisions a future uh, that where um, propaganda runs the world, and people basically are brainwashed with propaganda of one sort or another, and the whole thing is ruled by a, a small group of individuals uh, who organize this <clears throat> society. There have been a number of references to this novel. Oh, by the way, this is where Big Brother comes from. Yep. Uh, yes. Uh, for those of you who use that but have never read the novel, read the novel. Um, 
there have been several references to this uh, with the current political situation in the U.S. and in particular <laughs> into a phenomenon that's in 1984 called double speak, right? Uh, which is a type, or I'm sorry, double. Uh, the language is, double is new speak. The uh, the rationality is double think. It's the act of ordinary people simultaneously accepting two mutually contradictory beliefs as correct. <laughs> um, and it uh, goes on about uh, what doublethink is. And it's basically, um, and this is where I get to what is really important to me as a science pick of the week, it is twistedly uncritical thinking, right? Yeah. Uh, and this comes up in my mind several times. Uh, and let me just go back. We've talked, uh, occasionally we'll talk about uh, individuals who, like for example, uh, Jenny McCarthy, and it will slip out of us to say they can't talk about this or that because they're not scientists, okay? I think that's a mistake to say that. You don't have to be a scientist to think critically. Yes, if you are trained as a scientist, you are trained in critical thinking, and that's good. But as our listeners out there will understand, we got plenty of people listening who are not scientists, but who are capable of critical thinking. And I think that's what science training is, is about more than anything else, is training in critical thinking. But you can learn critical thinking in lots of other uh, fields, investigative journalism. Uh, 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 Trina Sidoris was a wonderfully uh, critical thinker. Um, and I think that critical thinking is <clears throat> uh, noticeably absent in some elements of our society now, and that's uh, what causes problems. And taken to the extreme, what you get is 1984. Hmm. It's ironic that you should pick that, Richard, because I came in yesterday morning before I knew about your pick, and Vincent and I were having a conversation, and I said, this is a clear-cut case of double talk and double think, mm. and double speak, rather. I said, and that takes us back to 1984. And then just you opened your email, and yeah. there the pick yeah. was. And I said, "Bingo!" You Talking know, Talking about the shutdown, right? Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> of course, that's cool. Yeah, very good. Alan Dove, what do you have for us? Uh, I already gave mine. That's really? True. Yes. yes, he, he did. did. Where am I? <laughs> All right, where are you? Uh, Yours. How about if I give mine? Sure. I'll Art, give yeah. mine. Good, good. Please, <laughs> please. I picked uh, a picture of damselflies, yes. uh, which I got from the Guardian Eyewitness app. So I also linked to the Eyewitness app, which is a free app. Every day they hmm. put on this app a gorgeous photo taken by someone. And they oftentimes will have uh, photography hints. And they also sometimes will list the kind of camera that it was taken with. And so I've now figured out what is the preferred camera of the professional photographers. Right. But the damselfly photo I sent to you guys separately earlier this week. And one of my friends said, oh, that's really good. I'm sure that they have that on their wing book page. <laughs> so <laughs> -bum -bum. check out the picture of the damselflies. <laughs> and, yes. uh, yeah. It's really nice. It's a wonderful very picture. cute. Very cute. What is the preferred camera of professional uh, photographers? Uh, now, I knew you would ask that. I'll, I'll figure it out for next time. It's some kind of Canon SLR. Okay. It's 5D. Something. It's 5D. Oh, yeah. 5D. I think it's yeah. the 5D now. Yeah. It's the, yeah. it is the 5D. The hot one. Yeah. yeah. All right, Dixon. So you had originally given, give, gave, you had well, originally given me two picks. Yes. Do you want to stick with those? Sure. Which ones were they? <laughs> I have to give your picks for you? You do, you do. Which ones did I send? All right, you sent a YouTube video. Oh, that's right, I did. Which is a slow motion montage. Yeah, it was fantastic. I just thought that seeing things... I was trying to imagine... The reason why I picked it, I was trying to... I know this is going to sound absurd, but I was just trying to imagine myself as a viral particle. And I'm a virus, okay? So I encounter the cell, I encounter the cell. Now it's going to occur in real time. But it could take some time, all right? I don't know what the time of a virus is. Mm. How, what is the time clock of a virus? So it attaches. How long does it take from the attachment point to be included into the vesicle? How much time does it take then to unravel and to get the DNA or RNA out into the cytoplasm? So that, just thinking about those things, said, gee, I wonder what life would look like if I was a virus. It would probably look like a slow-motion movie. So then I started to say, you know, I just started to to surf, and then I got onto YouTube, and then I got onto the sprites, which could not have been captured without slow motion photography, which are uh, reverse direction 
lightning bolts which go up rather than down from the tops of clouds. Right. And they were only discovered recently because they just thought they were figments of their imagination or something else. So that's that's why I put this up, to get you to think about life at another in another time frame. Forget about another dimension. But this, when you slow it down slow enough so that you can see all of the details, can you imagine what it would look like if you could do the same thing for a cell and a virus that entered the cell and then started to replicate inside? If you could crawl in the cell and be the virus during replication, what would it look like? And that's that's basically where my imagination ended. And I just sent you that. Uh, this is a, a, it's a high definition slow motion montage. Yeah, it's cool. yeah, Pretty, it's, there's some cool things here. There are. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There are. Yeah, so, so who's left? Me? You. You. You're left. Um, I have two small picks. Well, one small one and one pretty big one. Uh, the first is a blog post from PopSci where they announced they're shutting off comments on their website. Really? Here's why we're shutting off our comments. Basically because people who don't do critical thinking end up posting on posts of theirs that are... People are idiots. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't they edit That's them? That's the short version. Can't so they just the, edit them? Do you know how much work it's is much required work. to edit comments on a site yeah. with the traffic yeah, like PopSite? Yeah, they get hundreds of, hundreds of They get yeah, thousands the of comments per story. Every time a story is posted, the comments know. keep rolling in, and know. somebody's got to sit there yeah, and, and sort them. through all the stupidity and all of the I spam. See, well, the spam, you can some of that you can you can filter out automated, but it's yeah, it's a huge, huge workload. The problem is you have a good article about real good science, and then some idiots in the comments trash it and then people believe the comments yeah, instead right. of the article yeah, so sure. so this is a really important issue because i often get crazy comments on my small virology website well i do too and i place. wonder i mean i really like all, all the do. good comments like we get here on twiv yeah we're pretty lucky we don't get that stuff because it's all emailed to us pretty much but i've yeah. always wondered about turning them off and here is a very popular site that's doing that, so yeah. mm-hmm. it's an interesting article to read. Read some of the book reviews on Amazon, and you'll see the same yes. thing. Yes. Yeah. They're horrible, some of them. And then um, <coughs> is an article that was published this morning in the New York Times. It's called, Why Are There Still So Few Women in Science? Mm-hmm. And um, it is a very long article. It's really, this is long form stuff by an, a professor of creative writing at the University of Michigan, Ellen Eileen Pollock. And she talks with a variety of female academicians in this really well done article. Kathy's not in there? Including, uh, <laughs> no, she's not in there. But uh, Joe Handelsman, who uh, has been on TWIM before, a professor of microbiology at Yale, is in here. And she was a co author on this very interesting study, uh, which uh, we did on TWIM also about the origins of gender uh, bias in science. So this is a cool article. I think you think it's going to be in the Sunday magazine, Kathy, is that right? I do because of the uh, URL link. It's 2013 slash 10 slash 06 slash magazine. Cool. Have you read this, Kathy? Yeah, I had it sent to me by at least four people so far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is there is there a bottom line? Um, the bottom line is that there's hope that things like Joe Handelsman research and other research can make some substantive changes. But uh, it's quite revealing because this woman who teaches creative writing at the University of Michigan starts out by telling you about her career as an undergraduate at Yale as a physics major. And she put all of that in a box at the end of her undergraduate major and has recently just kind of recent, uh, you know, started going through that box mm. again, uh, literally and figuratively. And... Um, so she and someone else thought, oh, there's, there'd be some big changes now at Yale because there's a woman as chair and so forth. And they went and talked to current physics majors that are who are women and were surprised to find out that there weren't a whole lot of changes in some of the attitudes. So uh, it is it is a long read, but it's got some really good things in it. And it um, has a quotation from Abby Stewart, who is the person that I know well from the advanced program here. Uh, who comments on that. And and she said things to the effect that, yeah, she thinks that there's hope that this research will start to make a a dent in people's thinking. The area where women have made a huge inroad on, which they never did before, has been the admission in medical schools. Yeah. 
Because I know our medical school now is up to 50-50. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that never, well. that never was the case, ever, mm-hmm. except in places like Russia and China. This has been a huge change. Right. Our graduate school class is now 50% female as well, at least. But, you know... But that's not... Uh, Beyond, that's not beyond science that. necessarily, but still. But I can tell you, um, back when I was at Georgia, and this is probably 20 years ago, mm. uh, I talked to one of my colleagues in the vet school who said, you know, the population of women in the vet school is something like 65% of that's the students. True. That's true. But who are in the uh, right. academic leadership positions? All men. Not, not very many men. women. Yeah, that's mostly that's all true. men. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Joe Handelsman likes to point out that microbiology has been one of the better careers for women compared mm-hmm. to all the others, academically anyway. Yeah. And um, So that's a cool article. Well, so we've had a couple of listener picks in our emails, and here's one more from Bernadita. She writes, Dear Twiv team, as always, thank you for the great podcast. As the Nobel Prize season is coming close... <laughs> I was wondering, would you mind giving your opinions on who in the field of virology would deserve or maybe should have gotten the Nobel Prize? I would also like to suggest a Nobel Prize-related blog post for Pick of the Week in surprise advance announcement, 2013 Nobel Prize in Physics awarded to the Higgs boson, which I found to be quite a nice read. Someone in the comments has suggested to award the the Peace Prize to Mother Nature. Huh. Any virologists should be getting the prize this year? Hmm. hmm. I have to think about that. <laughs> Present company excluded, of course. Well, <laughs> without, for sure. Virologists. Hmm. Who's the last virologist to get a Nobel? Would that be Zerhausen? And so um, that sounds right. And yeah. um, the two HIV. So right. Montagnier and Barry Sinusi. I think that was the last one. What what merits a Nobel Prize in virology? I'll tell you who should have gotten one, Maurice Hilleman. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. You did say that. But too late for that. He's dead. Yep. Well, we'll see. Yeah. I don't know. I can't think of anyone at this moment, but maybe between now and next week. Are they this week? I think that we'll start hearing him next Monday or so. I don't so, know. Dear. Well, we're going to... Well, well, if we if we have time before they do the medicine one, maybe we can give somebody the twiv bump for the Nobel. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right, this was a marathon. Twim Dixon yes. is exhausted. I can tell. I'm no, so no. sorry, Dixon. You're okay. No, no, I'm totally relaxed. I had a great time. This uh, episode will be at twiv.tv and also on iTunes. And if you like twiv, you can go over there to iTunes and comment the show or rate it, and that helps us to stay very visible. And if you have questions or comments, you can send them by email to twiv at twiv.tv. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks. This was a lot of fun. We still didn't get through them all, but... No, oh, dear. We're trying. We got, we We're got trying. a little closer, right? <laughs> That's yeah. right. That's right. But I must say, they are really thought-provoking. Uh, yeah, I, right? you know, the, email, the emails are just terrific. They, they make are. a perfectly good show, despite yeah, the comments of some listeners. Here, here. <laughs> Rich Condit is at the University of Florida, Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. My pleasure. Always a gas. Glad you could make it after the government shutdown. Yeah. <laughs> you'd, you'd rather be doing TWIV than... I would rather that. be doing TWIV, but I just, uh, just uh, making this up is going to be... Uh, well, it's, unfortunately, it's not my job to reschedule it. Nope. Yeah. Okay? Nope. I'll just do what they tell me. Yep. Exactly. Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com and also on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Always a pleasure. Good to have you in the TWIV Good to be here. Studio. Yeah. Take you on a tour of the floor now. Yes, absolutely. And show you how <laughs> See all the renovations. But right. were you... Uh, you were in my lab on this floor, right? On this floor, yes. Okay. It's Good. very floor. Dixon Despommier, also here in the TWIV studio, is at verticalfarm.com, medicalecology.com, and trichinella.org. Thank you, Dixon. Pleasure. Now four TWIVs in a row. Hey. This is like the old days. Getting like a regular again. <laughs> Do you like it? I love it. Or it's just doing it so I don't oh. bug you? Vincent, you know I love this. Okay. You know I love you. Alan, do you believe him? <laughs> he looks pretty persuasive. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm Vincent Rackin-Yellow. You can find me at virology.ws. 
You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. We have so many potential. I guess. I kind of really like, I don't know anything about sorghum. (laughs) (laughs) Sure. People people have to listen to Yes. Consider it done. I think that's a great one. (laughs) Okay. All right. I I like it. Add just a little more to that. This is to Sydney Kushner. I said, Sydney, I'll do anything. I'll I'll organize the departmental holiday party. I'll do whatever. (laughs) (laughs) Please don't throw me in the briar patch. (laughs) And and then you actually said to him, I don't know anything about sorghum. Yeah. (laughs) And, And the other thing was that, you know, the whole draw of this is they would go out to these farms and, and there was a particular place where they wanted to go and have, um, Biscuits and gravy. And, oh, and stuff. Yeah. oh yeah! Oh yeah! So yeah. oh yeah! Junior faculty always get the bullshit jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone can hear Dixon. Yes. Yeah. People complain that you sound thin. Really? I know. He's, I, take he's one not. look. Take okay, one look. Trust, trust us, people. He's not. <laughs>